Hello, and before you get started on this episode of Zapped to the Past, we would just like to say thank you to the following people. Andy Marsh, Cole Hutchinson, David Hearn, Sven Oser, 2000DC, Gary Heather, Roger McNally, Joshua Dove, Mark Fletcher, Etienne Wettingfield, Niall Bullitt, Alexander Gosling, Tim TJ Walker, Matthias Eiberg, Phil Sowerby, Joshua K, Dominic Kendrick, Rune P, Steve Parant, Nick James and Daniel Spreadbury. These awesome people have chosen to back our Patreon at the C64 tier and we are hugely appreciative of the support they offer. If you want to join them and get a mention in next month's shout out, access to our Discord server and any special releases we put out and other cool stuff, then sign up by the 18th of the month at patreon.com forward slash zapped to the past for little more than the price of a pint of beer. It helps us keep playing the games so you don't have to. Anyway, please enjoy this episode of Zapped to the Past. And welcome to episode 65 of Zap to the Past. My name is Adrian Mills and I'm joined as ever by Graham Raddings. If you haven't listened before, this is a podcast where we discuss games that were released for the Commodore 64. Last week, in the epic 64th episode, we looked at our first batch of games from issue 30 of Zap 64, which we are in no way affiliated with. And we were freaked out by Frenesis, dismayed at Destructo, and full-on bubbly over Bubble Bobble. This week, we're going to be continuing our look at October 1987 and the second batch of games reviewed in issue 30 of Zap 64, along with what was also going on in UK music that month. So, Graham, what have we got going on in this week's episode? In this suspiciously lavish opticians with elaborate displays of inexplicably expensive designer glasses frames, a token thick plastic framed budget section, multiple glasses wearing assistants, and an eye test that seemingly involves uncomfortable steampunk goggles and a 9 million watt light direct right to your eyeballs of an episode. We take three multi-skilled floaty robots to an isometric maze in the blockbustery hexagon-mapped collectometric red LED, strengthen our size in the unlikely event of them ever splitting through laughter at the black and white funless wandering world of Laurel and Hardy, and enter the dull grey maze of boring, looking for fun in such minigame delights as avoid the rocks or laser bench in the stupid Cosmonaut. We also develop a temperature and headache in the irradiated log section of the Florida Everglades looking for plants in the relentlessly monotonous Swamp Fever. Dive into the camel-strewn madness of yet another Jeff Minton mind meld in the brain-rung-inducing Revenge of the Mutant Camels 2 and grab our aviator shades, nip out for a quick game of beach volleyball and then dive into the cockpit of our jet fighters to engage in some aerial dogfighting in the Top Gun-inspired Ace 2. If that collection of green and red lines is neither here nor there, or just plain or blurry, and you no longer see the need or purpose of reading a card number plate from nine miles away, we play the world's dullest, stupidest, and crappiest racing game in the ancient turbo-inspired horror of Death Race. Fly through the F dimension, defending another load of boring space arcs in yet another crap Iridium clone with Starforce Nova, and once again board the one frame per hour not so express train to Crapville, calling up Dullington, Boring on Sea, Upper Stupid, Lower Frame Rate, and Shittington in the horrifically slow Evening Star. We also take a tiny road trip on the super sensitive expressway to Angerville, ensuring we frequently explode and get frustrated in the tiresome Morphic or the Transforming Car, before finally slipping into our best animated catsuit and sneaking around the city looking for fish bones, while deftly avoiding the Parliament of Owls in the furball inducing Night on the Tiles. Goodness, that was a lot of hard work. No wonder my eyeballs are both bored and angry. Play some of these games and it's back to that 8-bit pink eye again, Adrian. I'm not going to lie. I'm really not. I know what's coming up. None of that fills me with joy. No, (laughs) I've spent all all week cleaning up bloody dog eggs. (laughs) Bloody everywhere. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, I've had to remove three controllers out of my walls. Um, I've just thrown them in frustration and horror. Yeah, yeah. 
not to give spoilers away, we love this week's games. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, D- did you get the impression we didn't like them? Yeah, I don't what, know where that, that came from. You, you read you read that from what we said. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's not what I heard. I heard good. You will things. though. <laughs> you <laughs> will okay. though. You, you will. This is a this is a proper we play them so you don't have to week. Oh, that's been um, one of those. Yeah. Should we get into the first one? We ain't got anything else to do. Have we? Let's just let's get go in. for it. Let's, let's go get in. in. And our first one um, is, well, probably, I mean, it may be the only decent one this week. Maybe, who knows? This is, uh, it was the Sizzler. It got 93%. It's a full price, nine ninety nine, And this is Red LED, Red LED, whatever, Red LED. So, yeah, so let's kick off episode 65 with our favorite perspective on games. Yes, an isometric shoot 'em up and collect 'em up is here in the shape of Red LED or Battle Droids, as it was known everywhere, seemingly, but in the UK. I think Australia it was Red LED as well, but in the US uh, and everywhere else, it was battle droids with a z um so not oh, sure why well, it had to have a z didn't it? i knew you were gonna say that of course it did not sure why the name changed because uh, i'm not sure really what red led is supposed to mean either it's, uh, it's having played the game, nothing I, d- I don't know what it means it's it's uh you know it's, it's the standby light on your telly yeah it makes no sense <laughs> in this game no but you know battle droids complete with the rad z sounds much better anyway so this was made by starlight software for areola soft it had visuals by Pete James and sound effects by Mr. Tony Crowther. I'm not quite sure who programmed it, but it was someone there. Now, this is the fourth game from Starlight uh, that we've seen. And the others are Greyfell, The Adventures of Norman, Dogfight 2187, or Dog Egg 2187, and Death Chase. Um, oh. and none of which we liked for various and manifold reasons. Uh, but here we have their first game to rate highly. Even Zap noted this down. So it's been a sizzler. So what, you know, if anything, let's have a look. So what's gone right here? And what's Battle Droids or Red LED? I'm going to say, I hate to say Red LED. It annoys me. Um, so what's it all about? So as noted on the cover somewhat self-deprecatingly once again the earth resources are running out uh, and that's, that's the game cover by the way so and the only way to avert this catastrophe is to bridge the path to the much needed matter supplies and you do this by controlling three different zmx all-purpose battle droids which will allow you to link up the vital cosmic interface grid there you go that's the plot well i'm pleased to know that why don't they call it red zmx but never mind i'll shh shh now <laughs> Shush you. Shush you with your with your better ideas. Uh, what does all that mean then? What it actually means is we get to play a digital version of Blockbusters where we are the blue team trying to <laughs> connect <laughs> a series of... <laughs> yeah, <it is>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, <that. laughs> We're trying to connect a series of hexagons from one side of a map to the other, uh, only with less Bob Holness and with more droid shooting. Um, <laughs> you know, I'd like Blockbusters if it, Bob Holness just turned out to be some kind of killer Sentient robot. Droid. Yeah, it would be way yeah. better. He'll have a pee. A pee, please, Bob. I hate that joke. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Shot just looks at him and his eyes just flash for a second and it's just smoke. <laughs> just smoke and a small pile of ash. You lost. You lost. <laughs> we should reprogram him. Keep saying lose instead of lost. Don't go near him. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Who was responsible for broken the grammar on this thing? <laughs> oh, that was me. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, there's less Bob Holness in this, which is a shame. Once the game starts... You're greeted with a map. So you've got this map, a kind of a map. It's a series of interconnected hexagons. So it's essentially, it's like the Blockbusters board almost. Um, each one of these hexagons represents, for those who don't know, for people, other people in the world, if you've never seen Blockbusters, Blockbusters was a quiz show in the 80s. I think it came back quite recently as well, actually. But there were two, team, there were two teams. There was, a, there was a, a duo versus a single person. And the duo had to get across the board, sort of link in from one side to the other. They had to get five questions right. And that would colour in that letter. You had, you, each one was based around a letter. The single person had to go up, so they only had four ones. It was a quiz show against them. And if you got there, you got to go on the, what was the, um, was it not the gold rush? What was it called? When if they got to the end and they got to go up and they had to answer the oh, questions. I can't remember now. It was, the, it was gold, wasn't it? It was, it was something what, gold. Yeah, the gold run. Gold, was it the gold, gold run? Gold run, that's it, yeah. Yeah, where they could win all the prizes. Anyway, that was it. So it was, it was, and it was always, uh, it was students, wasn't it? It was a student-based game. So it was all be, students, yeah. yes, yeah. Um, so that's that. Anyway, so in this there are different coloured hexagons, and there are four yellow, eight green, sixteen blue, eight purple, and one red. And so that gives a total of thirty-seven worlds. Each hexagon is a world to play through, and you can play through them as you please. Um, so on this map screen, you move a small hand around and select the world you wish to visit. At the bottom of the screen is the UI info for the state of the game. You have your three droids, and they're happily sort of bouncing around, little animated things, uh, along with the state of the timer. Because yeah, I didn't mention it, did I? So in Flash Gordon style, we only have 59 minutes and 59 seconds to save the Earth, uh, so better get to it. Also, that was the amount of time we have for um, Shadow Fire, if I remember all the way back Correct. to episode one. Probably because it's a nice, simple thing, and it? it'd have to go over an hour, so you, you can fit them both in. You know, there's only two digits needed. 
needed. So before you pick your droid, you need to think carefully as they all have different abilities and strengths to some degree. The first one um, is called Fang, um, and he's not affected by slopes and the like, but he hates acid pools. Who doesn't? Uh, the second one, who I've called Floaty, will slide up and down slopes, so he he's, he, he is, succumbs to gravity. But because he floats, he's not affected by the acid pools. And then there's the third one, which I have called Crapo, because he hates slopes and acid pools, So and he's therefore the what worst of the lot. Then? You are. Yeah, I know, it's Crapo. I thought that third you... one was crap. Yeah, it's Crapo. 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 Yeah. So we've got... F- Fang, Floaty, and Crapo. There you go. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, it's the Rice Krispies you don't want to eat. <laughs> anyway, click on the droid you want to use and the world you wish to visit. And essentially, you, it, just a little message comes up. We're teleporting you there and you're teleported to this world. So once there, the game itself proper starts, and we're treated to a what is an impressively fast 3D isometric viewpoint, um, multicolored, and I do mean fast. This is really quite snippy. This game it's very impressive for the C64. It looks, it has that marble madness look to it. So it's that kind of perspective and that kind of coloring and that kind of resolution. But whereas Marble Madness was just up and down and had issues with it scrolling, uh, this is full on 360 degree fast and smooth scrolling. This scrolls in all directions and and at pace and keeps you central as well, which is kind of useful. So it's good to see. So upon this world, you control your droid in all eight directions, and the object of each level is to find the prescribed number of crystal... Well, I've only I've described them as crystal Toblerone pieces, because I don't know what they actually are, but they look like Toblerone segments to me, um, and get the hell out of there. These pyramidal shapes are scattered about the landscape, and you must navigate it and move over them to pick them up. Once you do so, once you've collected them all, there's a teleport somewhere on the level. Basically, it's a hole in the level with arrows pointed to it. Uh, that's activated, and you make your way there, and if you drop into it, you teleport back to the map screen. Um, it's not that easy, though. Um, it's not as easy as just simply moving around and collecting stuff. There are rogue enemy droids and they are spawned constantly and they hunt you down. You can shoot them, uh, so you can shoot in all eight directions, uh, and you can destroy the spawners that they spawn from as well. But do be careful when doing that, for doing so makes the remaining enemies from other spawners, um, uh, they, they get more angry, and so they track you down even faster. So, you know, you've got a bit of risk-reward there. Collision with the enemies means you lose energy, which is represented by a green bar at the bottom of the screen. But shooting the spawners gets you some life back, so, you know, you've got to judge whether it's in your best interest to do so. You have to contend with enemies, the landscape, for if you fall off the landscape because there's edges to the landscape like I said it looks like uh, Marble Madness because it's and so it's set on a series of elevated platforms if you fall off it, you lose time so you don't you respawn back in so there's no you can respawn as often as you like when you fall off the off the map but you just lose time um, and, and as you only have an hour to complete the game you know you don't want to fall off that often I guess you can only fall off 60, 60 times don't you um, if you're that idiot, idiotic there are other pickups around as well like smart bombs which kill all the enemies on screen and there are also the letters that spell out the word bow Bonus, so B O N U S, which initiates a bonus screen if you collect them all. Uh, I never collected them all, so I never got to the bonus screen. So there you go. Um, there are also freeze objects, which makes the acid safe to go over for a period of time. So good old Fang and Crapo could move over the uh, move over the acid. Um, you got op- there are objects to pick up, which freeze the enemies in place, and objects which either increase or decrease your time left. So you've got to be careful. You don't want to pick up the ones that decrease the time, but do pick up the ones that increase it. There are also teleports as well, which zip you around the level, um, and all this is done. All this is controlled via the joystick. It's it's all, there's nothing there. You go on and teleport, you press fire, teleport you. All this works. Should you collect all the mystical Toblerone pieces and escape, you go back to the map screen and that sector, that hexagon, is now flashing with all the colours of the rainbow or, or 16 or whatever it is that the C64 can muster. Um, and that basically means you now own that one. So you remember you've got a link from one side of the map to the other. You now own that. That's yours. However, should you run out of energy whilst attempting it, then that sector, you go back to the map screen and that sector is now turned white. Um, and you can, and that's it. You don't own that one. Once attempted, once you've attempted a, 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 a hexagon, an area, and you've either won it or lost it, that sector cannot be attempted again. So should you die, um, you lose both the use of that droid for the rest of the game and you lose that sector. So dying is bad in, in a, quite a number of ways. If you make it out alive, though, it allows you to use the droid uh, or another one on the next sector. So you keep that droid alive. You want to keep them alive. You don't want to die. If you lose all three of your droids, then it's game over. Or if you run out of time, it's game over. So just remember that you've got to make it from one side of the map to the other to win. So you do not need to do all the sectors, the 37, but you know, you've only got to do a few. All you've got to do is just enough to form a link. So what we have here is a kind of weird mashup of Gauntlet with the spawning enemies in the style of the maps, if, if Gauntlet was seen from an isometric perspective. Mutants, I thought, with its ability to select any section you want mm. at will, and the three different types of droids kind of read the three different types of armament bullets you had in 
Mutants for your disposal, mm. and Marble Madness for the visual style. So you, it's kind of a mashup of those three kind of games. Oh, and, and Blockbusters, of course. So don't forget Blockbusters that's in there. And it just about works this. It's fast and responsive, I thought, which is what you want in this kind of game. Although the spawning enemies will do your head in after a while, I found. The premise is simple, and the ability to approach each map with a different style of droid, and also whatever map you want at any given moment. So you can pick any any of those 37. It's just up to you. Um, gives the player a solid amount of choice as to how they approach the game. They can just go for it and try and get from side to side and win or they can go on a high score hunt and try and do as many of the sectors as they want it's up, it's up to you you've got a good it's up to, uh, and so if you do lose a sector it's not lost because you can kind of go around it it's going to take you more time and everything like that it's all good it's hard though I'll say that this is hard because controlling the droids is slightly tricky that they've gone um, for an up so if you press up you move towards the top right control method and I think that's maybe the wrong choice I kind of get why they've done that because if obviously you're going up it's because it's seen from the isometric viewpoint mm. but i can't help feeling that in a game with 360 degree skull and a movement i think if they had just left up as up it would have worked better so they just left up yeah. as up and top right is moving the top right and so you move the joystick in the way that it moves on screen you kind of have to almost tilt your joystick like you know 45 degrees and then it kind of works but it's still a bit weird you can you can get used to it but it's it's okay it's just uh, there was a bit of a nipping and i found myself falling off places sometimes because i was pushing the wrong direction but ayo. it's an unusual mashup this but saying all that i thought it felt cohesive and it worked and and it's possible, you know, and working your way, there's a bit of spin dizzy in there as well, you know, throw spin for the viewpoint and the looks and the feel of their visuals and everything going around. But obviously this is a scrolling thing where spin dizzy was a, um, you know, single flick screen affair. I thought it's worked well. It's a tough, I've never, I don't think I ever played this or if I did, I didn't really get on with it. I didn't really, I don't think I knew what I was doing because it's quite esoteric in its visuals and what it looks like and it doesn't really communicate what you've got to do. So you kind of need to know. And back then, obviously, if you didn't have instructions and I probably didn't because I don't, I never owned this. It would be hard to understand exactly what you're supposed to be doing collecting space to- Toblerones to to win blockbusters is a hard you know hard thing to communicate but now it's I true. did know I enjoyed my time with this I thought it was good it's tough but it's fun and I did I like this overall I thought this was good I just wish those controls would have been the just twisted round 45 degrees or whatever other than that no good game i liked it what about you yeah it was all right odd combination of things wasn't it yeah marble madness mixed with a kind of weird collect em up type thing mixed with a like you say a mishmash of quite a few different games really visually though amazing isn't it it, it really did play out quite well and fast i was quite impressed with that mm. um it played out really well i mean yeah during the because all the screens had a coherent link to each other they it felt like a really nice solid produced game mm. the graphics i thought were quite good and as as you said it scrolls fast this, this game is is really well coded Coded. It's it's really really good demonstration of clever coding. I think I like the way you selected the things as well with a little sort of pointy finger thing, mm-hmm. which felt like it wasn't a laborious thing to move around for once. Yes. So it all worked pretty well. Levels were quite ingeniously designed, you know, and and it was it was good. Um, the inertial con- inertial controls are a little bit challenging at times, so you find yourself flying off the edges of platforms pretty easily. But you know you do get used to that over time, and you'd get better at it. Sounds are a bit basic. I guess that's the payoff between having the really fast graphics and having the really decent graphics and the set and yeah. all of that is that you you know you don't have a lot of sound here but that's by the by map screen was kind of handy actually a map screen that pointed in the right directions handy that um, mm. take note every game we've played in the last three episodes that has a crap map oh, yeah, and a stupid yeah, direction system yeah there's a map screen isn't there you can bring up yeah. to show you so I thought it was quite yeah. good. Yeah, it's a decent and complete game. I never, I'd never actually seen or heard of it at all ever. So I was kind of pretty fresh to this. And yeah, since it, it does borrow the styling of many other games, you could sort of pick out its influences. But that's no bad thing because for once they've picked out the good things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a good sense of difference here. It's it is different. It plays differently, and I like the fact that you've got loads of approaches to it. It might be a bit boring for some. I think you might get a bit tired of the controls because, the, like you said, they can be challenging to feel the up thing and the inertia. But I persevered with it for quite a while, and I got. Uh, I got on with it pretty good. Definitely worth the uh, 93%, I think, for once. I think that's about bang on for them. So, Mm. uh, yeah. Yeah, good, good. I enjoyed it. Really good game. Uh, so uh, definitely go and check it out if you get a minute. Indeed, you know, sort of digital, weird, isometric blockbusters type Toblerone collecting. Yeah, absolutely. Thing. Yeah, it's odd, a really odd game, but odd games seem to be quite good. We had Deceptor, didn't we? Last time that was an odd one. We've got this is the odd game. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah, yeah. The, the odd the, game the, hypothesis. Well, it's a, it's a, if games do something different and do it well, then they can they can pull it off. If they can put like I think, right? You said if you pull the good bits out of games rather mm. than the bad bits, as we see quite a lot. Yeah. Um, then it, it works all right. Yeah, there we yeah, go. Red yeah, LED, good. a red LED, battle droids, whatever you want to call it. It's worth a look. So go and play, have a play of that because that might be all you want to play from <laughs> today. Might, might very well be. <laughs> it might very well be. So there you go. Uh, battle droids, we like that. Red LED, red LED. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, let's move on to our next one. Do-do, do-do, do-do. 
Do 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 do. Why yeah yada. Anyway, uh, Graham Don't... Laurel and Hardy. Yeah, how was that? How was that for you, Laurel and Hardy? Goodness me, this was utter shit. Um, <laughs> so this is goaded by Andy Wilson. Andy That's Wilson did five mess. It's another fine mess. <laughs> to be fair, Andy Wilson did Dan Dare. I know. Um, graphics by Stu Jackson, who did, I think he did Dan Dare as well, but he's Nemesis mm. and Gradius. This is, you know, because it's got, it's got the title screen and all of that stuff is good. So this is supposed to be a side splitting tribute to the comedy masters, Stan and Ollie. And you'll find them in this game chasing each other across the city to throw custard pies at one another. Why is this comedy gold happening? <laughs> um, well, let me tell you. Uh, Stan apparently got in the way of a custard pie or a flan. Custard pie or flan, it's interchangeable in this game. Um, that was lobbed by Ollie, and so he's seeking revenge. Because as we all know, Adrian, revenge as a motif is what made Laurel and Hardy the hilarious comedy <laughs> duo they are today. Well-respected, timeless comedy. Yeah. Huh? Anyway, the game is a one- or two-player side-scrolling affair that sees the split screen into Ollie at the top and Stan at the bottom. I don't know if that's interchangeable. Whenever I started the game, that's who I got. Anyway, in those positions. Both players need to locate a map uh, from the map shop, uh, which will display in your UI in the middle. Mm. A useless map, but we'll come to that. And then you wander around the city buying custard pies from pie shops to throw at your opponent or finding them. Once you have successfully hit your opponent with enough pies, you win. In the opening screen, uh, these some options which allow you to choose. Really strange the way the options are laid out. and There seems to be loads of them, but anyway. Some yeah. options where you can choose one or two players and which variation of this and that you've got. You can choose which one is Stan and Ollie. You can also decide on how many pies you need to land in order to win. So it's kind of a really half assed spy versus spy, this mm-hmm. in a kind of way. There's other objects in the game, such as a bicycle, which is the only other object I came across, which enabled me to sort of uh, speedily wander around. But it doesn't work everywhere in the game, apparently, although I've never found a place where it didn't. And your opponent can leave tire popping sharp things around, although I never found them and that never happened. So I don't know. Apparently, <laughs> as it seems to be the way with these games, uh, the logic of simple left and right navigation is replaced with stupid directional arrows. So you may not actually be going the way you think you are at any given moment. Really nope. stupid. Although you will always go in, be going left or right. That's for sure. As you expend energy running and walking around, you'll get thirsty, which is shown by your character's face getting darker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Weird to introduce that anyway. To quench yeah. your thirst, you can pop into the various bars and have a good old drink, and then you get back on the pie hunt. Picking up custard pies engages flan mode, um, and your fire <laughs> button throws it, hopefully, at target. If you st- still are not in flan mode, you can bring up some options, or you can click it, and it sort of says hello, or how do you do, and it's just, it, none of that really makes much sense in the context no, of the game. No, I anymore. couldn't figure out what was going on with that. So the spleen, the spleen, your spleen will be split. The screen is split <laughs> into three sections. Um, you've got Ollie and Stan at the top and the bottom, and in the middle, there's the map sort of area, um, a little player indication and a piano player I'm just playing the piano I will come to the music shortly because you control what's going on with the joystick if that's the option you've chosen and the graphics in this of course so you control your character going left and right the fire button does the actions and things the graphics in this are black and white of course they're black and white because it's you know Stan and Ollie mm-hmm. so I suppose the Stan and Ollie sprites do look a bit like what they're meant to be in that context the backgrounds though are a dazzling repetitive and twitchy <laughs> affair <laughs> I think there was some kind of attempt at some old film effect. It doesn't work, though. It looked more glitchy and twitchy, which made moving around eventually nauseous. Um, the weird lack of variety and complete absence of other characters leaves this feeling more like Laurel and Hardy's version of the Amiga Man at times. Um, <laughs> the joystick controls are really bloody terrible. It speeds up and runs and takes ages to slow down and stop, so you're perpetually flying past things and having to double back on yourself all the time. Remember that in this game, you're meant to be trying to find your Stan or, or, or Ollie, but you're never actually going to find them because it's. I think it's next to impossible possible and i actually put this to the test i'll come back to that as well so the music is meant to be it's meant to kind of go with the chase I and mean, it's more like the classic laurel and hardy theme is then played back in a completely random order as if the cd was skipping continuously and it's really 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 bloody annoying and i mean really annoying and so while the intention is to have fun and laughs those are the two things you don't have when you play this game <laughs> what you'll get is earache and eye strain <laughs> <laughs> Laurel and Hardy are generally the less, less well known <laughs> silent movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what they duo. were known for before. And yeah, what you'll get is yeah, the the recognized Laurel and Hardy are generally f- are famous as a duo. So placing them in a game where is there's little chance of them meeting is just plain dumb. It's utterly utterly crap. This and such a shame because I really like Laurel and Hardy and Laurel and Hardy are brilliant fodder for a fun game. Even if it was a kind of a, a head, Frankie goes to Hollywood type game, you know, where you're going in and out of houses, picking things up. Even if it was just like that or Jack the Nipper type game where you're just doing 
doing silly stuff. That would have been better than what this is, where you're just wandering around looking for something and you will not find them. It's next to impossible. Now, for some bizarre reason, you can actually put this game into AI versus AI, so you can just let the computer play out. So I thought, well, I'm going to do that because I want to see how long it takes the computer to find itself. <laughs> 35 minutes it took. <laughs> Because I said it, I said it's a Commodore versus Commodore mode, CBM versus CBM, and set to, set it to activate under a single Pi. Thirty-five minutes it took of them just wandering around aimlessly, just wandering and wandering, periodically having a quick pint, periodically <laughs> stopping off to buy a pie. Thirty-five minutes of that, watching that with that awful music just jittering and twitching and everything else, and then in the end it was like, "Hey, hey, pie done, gone," and back to the title screen. I was like, "What a load of crap you are!" That does it explain really, really those very me. strange messages I was getting for about fifteen, twenty minutes the other day. <laughs> <laughs> but clearly you were in some uh, <laughs> flickery screen Laurel and Hardy music um, yes. psychosis, I can only presume. Yes, that's exactly what it was. So uh, that's the uh, that's what I thought of that game. It's, it's dreadful, 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 dreadful. And and, it's, and shame, really, that a, such a good, fun legacy as such as Laurel and Hardy, because the Laurel and Hardy are comedy geniuses. It's still to this day, yeah. there, some of their... Well, all of their stuff generally makes me laugh at some level, even if it's just silly, but not like this. This is just stupid and, a, and no, 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 no. This is full price as well. 17% yeah. Zap gave it. Give them zero, Zap. Be brave about it. <laughs> rubbish. Utterly rubbish. What about you? Yeah. I mean, I it's terrible, isn't it? I mean, I can kind of see, given the license, why they went with something along the lines of Spy versus Spy. It's just the problem is they made the map, by making the map massive and boring, they've missed the point of the fact that in Spy versus Spy, you were always only seconds away from something happening um True. so it was quick so you know whether you enjoyed that or not is up to you but at least that design was solid the small map you know you, it was always a few seconds away from whether finding something finding each other having a fight a trap going up whatever here you just you meander for ages around boring monochromatic levels that jiggle in an approximation oh, of a black and white it. film looking for flans to then try and find your opponent to lob said flan at and then you repeat if you if you if you're foolish enough to pick five flan to win mode, oh, no. I can't imagine how long this is going to go on for. Sixty years. <laughs> it gets exponentially longer, so it's like a, it's like a dream within a dream in Inception. You know, that's what this is. So after each flan, it sort of t- so uh, yeah. By the fourth flan, it's seven years, and by the fifth flan, yeah, you, you're not doing it this lifetime. <laughs> Um, the standard Ollie sprites, I thought they were, yeah, they're recognisable, so they were okay. Uh, the presentation is interesting for the way it's done, but though the repetitive Laurel and Hardy music will make you want to kill in short order. Um, yep. It's dreadful. It's nothing. It's all that's for nothing though. And the game is just bland and empty. It's, it's a really strange and pointless license yep. tied to a boring ripoff of a game series I don't like. It was never going to be a winner with me, not ever. It's a crap game of a you know a, a crapper version of something I already don't like. Yeah. So this was it's just what what were they thinking? Well. I was trying to think, what would you do with the Laurel and Hardy game? You know, maybe some mini things based on classic moments, like pushing a piano up the stairs or something. Yeah, or... just change, just make make a game like Bruce Lee, but with Stan and Ollie. Yeah. Just have silly comedy stuff, or even the Goonies. That kind of game would have really played Absolute, out well in yeah, this kind absolutely. of environment. Single, single screen puzzlers. Yeah, where you've got to use both both of their yeah. uh, abilities, whatever yeah, they absolutely. may be. Yeah, don't know. Crap, though. Laurel and Hardy. Yeah. Ugh, does it get better? Let's find out. Let's move along and let's get into our next one. So our next one is Cosmonaut. So it's a pun, Graham. It's a pun title. It's your favourite kind. <sighs> Cosmonaut. Um, so this is a budget mini game kind of thing collection from Codemasters. It's developed by Blitter Animations, has coding by Tim McCarthy, graphics by Nigel Brown, and a three second loop of music by our favourite David Whittaker. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not bad music in this. It's probably the best thing about it, <laughs> to be fair. So in this game, this so this part will all sound very exciting. In this game, two giant robots are fighting it out. They are the size of mountains and are battling to the death for the fate of two conflicts in races on the planet Cybor. That's pretty exciting, doesn't it? Two massive mm, robots. Yeah, very, yeah, fight. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I bet this is Ace. <laughs> you are Cosmonaut, though, a small droid that's got into the head of your massive robot, and you need to clear out all the other races' droids and viruses and stuff that they have planted in there in an unfair attempt to win and make you lose the battle. Now, it's a battle to the death. Nothing is unfair, <laughs> and everything, as far as I'm concerned, is on the table. So using the word unfair in this is, uh, is uh, you know, a miss. I don't like that, because it's death or nothing so anyway yeah save your hopes for massive robots fights because if you manage to get to the end of the game which you probably won't so that's where those will actually happen but you play as cosmonaut who you are a little i don't know are you a spaceman you're like a little spaceman wandering around a uh, a really simple maze the top-down maze it's not very particularly interesting you just wander around this maze 
And there are some there are some enemies in the maze that you can shoot. Don't walk into them, you lose a life. Uh, but there are also there's these, these colored squares. So there's some of these colored squares. These are big colored squares. If you walk into one of them, this transports you to one of the mini games. So the back of the box says five different types of games. So there are three different mini games. I presume the one is the robot fight at the end. One is the maze. And there are three of these mini games that you can get sort of flung into. And they're pretty simple. And they range from a game where you fire at the center of the screen from the four corner points. You know, as if you're in sort of a 3D laser, as sprites, as various sprites fly past on set, you can't move, you can't do anything. You just got to hope they fly across the center of the screen and you fire at the right point to shoot them all. Uh, that's that one. Uh, you've got a time limit. If you're destroying them, if you destroy them all, then that wins that screen. Um, if you don't, then you back out into the maze. Uh, you've got another one where you have to jetpack across the screen while asteroids fly in from the right. So you've got to go from the left of the screen to the right of the screen. And there are asteroids moving on basically just uh, you know horizontally, but there's loads of them. And they push you back. If you get across to the right hand side of the screen and off the right hand side, you win that one. And that's that one. That's all you've got to do. So strangely enough, though, in that one, you pull down to fire your jetpack, which I thought Stupid. was weird. Why not press the fire button? Um, because that's logical. <laughs> just don't know. So then there's another one. The third one, you have to walk along a four-track highway from left to right. So this was, but it doesn't, there's no parallax scrolling or anything. This was kind of like, um, you know, uh, what was the, uh, what's the one with the, where you lose your head if you bump into people? It was the Shockway Rider type. Shockway Rider. It's kind of a similar idea to that, I guess. Uh, so there's boulders coming along and you've got to move up and down and contact with any of them you, you die and that's it so basically you just got to survive long enough and get across um there are two maze stages to make it through so if you make it through all these little mini games throughout this throughout the stage you get to a second one the second stage up the ante on the difficulty of all the stages and it gets really really hard really really fast if you make, if you make it through that you get to see the massive robot fight so um i'm going to post a picture of this it looks like the robots i don't know in my head i had sort of mecha you know arms and stuff but no these kind of look like the robots from the original Lost in Space. They're facing off against each other. And unfortunately, one of them, again, as we saw in Mag Max, so, you know, a few few episodes ago, seems to have suffered from, you know, well, not suffer from, but just has massive robot wang again. So we've got another case All the best of, ones do, you know. <laughs> we've got another case of huge robot wang. People like robot wang, it seems, at this point in time. And if you manage to win that, then well done, you win the game. So there's fighting. You're just shooting across the screen at each other. There's no movement. There's nothing in this. Um, the box, as I said, it claims five mini games. I guess this works out at four 40p a game there's 199 but that's still 40p too much none of them are any good that um one where you have to fire into the screen into the middle is so ridiculous because it's so predisposed on the sprites moving across the middle of the screen which they quite often don't and so there's nothing you can do to win it (laughs) it's just ridiculous then there's the uh one the 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 jetpack one as i said which is let down by stupid controls down to thrust ridiculous whilst also trying to move left and right stupid and then the other one which is you'll just get locked into a put well boulders will just come across and so it's like oh i'm kind of screwed because i can't there's no gap to move between them and the collision mm-hmm. detection on it is very punishing it's all a bit rubbish if i'm honest it's not very good i hate the pun title the best thing about it as i said it's probably mr whittaker's music at the start it also feels really basic not really basic just really basic gameplay elements with, with kind of the hope it's like that stupid comic game thing it's just like you hope you're putting a load of stuff together randomly and you hope that that spells value it doesn't it spells boring cosmo not is my uh last comment <laughs> (laughs) on this as I said, that pun title is stupid. So I, I didn't get on with it. It's got forty six percent. I think it's too high. Maybe, as I said, forty p a game. You might get some fun out of wandering around a boring maze. But yeah, I didn't like this. What about you? As soon as I heard that oddly twee Dave Whitaker music burst forth in its fifteen second looping glory, I knew what I was in for. <laughs> I thought Codemasters. All right, Codemasters have you know they've got a bit of a track record, maybe. And then it was it unveiled veiled the spaceman in the maze wandering around thing. I was like, oh really? And then I got onto the flashy squares and then played the stupid crap mini games which were all crap really boring grey graphics grey and boring some attempt at base relief with weird enemy sprites that just look mm. naff and blendy and horrible mini games include such amazing highlights as you said shoot the bouncing enemies from a laser powered park bench at a central point <laughs> with no control over anything so really it's just yeah. potluck avoid yeah. the rocks That's part of it. avoid the rocks good old avoid the rocks we love that we can't avoid them though so it's not no. really avoid the rocks it's just get pushed by rocks at some point and dodge the barrels which you can't do either so Eventually, you're just going to get whacked by the barrels. So it's just no one wants to get whacked whacked in the barrels. Um, so it's just all, it's all we'll write me Cosmo nuts. Oh, oh God. Oh, my barrels. <laughs> my precious barrels. I call that one, so I call that one Cosmo. Not wanting to, that uh, one nuts. Because I didn't want to really play these games, mini or otherwise, for very long. 
even at two pound, there's just there's more fun to be had with other titles. Go and get Kickstart too, and yes. don't bother with this stupid nonsense. It's rubbish. You should not have got forty six percent. That means it's half, even half good, which it isn't. Mm-hmm. So I would give him this exactly one percent, and I would only give it one percent because of the fifteen second looping music. Yeah, because so, it isn't terrible. It's just I just knew what I was in for when I heard it. So now, yeah, you say no. Cosmonaut, definitely yeah. Cosmonaut, indeed. There we go. Let's move along to our next one. Which is Swamp Fever. Now, ironically, if you add this one and Cosmonaut together, you get 100% again, just like we did with Bubble Bobble and Adventures of Video Game. Adventures of Alice, whatever it was. Weird. Um, so, yeah, it's 54, another budget. Swamp Fever. Tell us all about what it's like to have Swamp Fever, Graham. Swamp Fever. Uh, this is created by Keith Harvey, who did Crazy Coaster and Electrics, or does those. I don't know if he did or does. I can't remember the dates on those. Graphics are by Keith Harvey. Title screen, Keith Harvey. Music, <laughs> Keith Harvey. Oh, it says in brackets, he famously did Howling Mad. I don't know what I don't even know why, I think, why I've written I think that what it means. I think that's his um pseudonym. Howling I think Mad? he goes under the name Howling Mad. Is why music why would you script. have your name three times on the same game and then use a pseudonym? Anyway, I'm not going to question him because Maybe he was why suffering would I? from swamp fever. He might have been with us. So this does kind of live in the WTF file of games for me. <laughs> Because it's just weird. Even the review in Zap looked like a complete afterthought and totally disingenuous. Like they hadn't even played it, really. It was just like, yeah, there's a game set in, in, in uh, swamps. Yeah it's, yeah, it's swampy. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's all right. That was the sum total of their review. In this game, however, I shall give it a little bit more depth. You prefer, you actually play the character of Professor Oddbod and you're deep in the depths of the Florida Everglades, or at least the Florida swamps, the logging section of the Florida swamps. Just saying, because they're basically you're trapped in some kind of log maze. Nuclear waste contamination has given rise to a wave of plant mutations. Your mission is to enter the swampy Everglades and pick the plants for further experimentation and analysis. So armed with your inflatable dinghy and a gun, you zoom off to gather the plants, but beware. Swamp creatures will attack you, so you must navigate the side-scrolling world, shoot the enemies, and pick the plants. That's it. The game plays weirdly, and the music is a peculiar kind of bass drone that, after a while, really gets you in a way that is really hard to explain. Yeah. You scroll your play around shooting and finding and collecting. It's all controlled by joystick. The main window in the game area is kind of medium res graphics. As I said, depicting the Florida swamps in some kind of log infested logging area with loads of logs. Very loggy. <laughs> I guess it's, I guess that kind of background is easy to loop. Or maybe that's the reason for that because there's lots of loopy backgrounds in this. Very loopy. The enemies are generally just kind of in the way in this game. There's no real logic to them. Just kind of Some of them try to follow you about or they, or they land on you or, or, or the AI goes to the extent that they will immediately target wherever you are. But they just kind of get in the way, just around just there yep. and the sprites are kind of small and a bit bitty I don't know if, what kind of sprites they are by design here there's not a lot of them on the screen in time so I don't know if there's no trickery I don't think but they're just a bit bitty and I suppose they're okay but the music is just I mean oh, it's just, just it's a discordant piece of crap and it really got to me there's no fun to be had here <laughs> in this game just wandering around a swamp picking plants is really boring after a while even and especially with that music drilling its way into your soul so it's another two quid disaster go and get kickstart 2 god's sake that's my review what about you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another. I put another cheapo cacophony of noise and horror greets our ears as we try and navigate the pseudo three irradiated swamps in search of glowing plants while being beset upon by various sprites of random design. It feels like a budget game as it has one central tenant and just does that without variation or change. You can move mm-hmm. up and down the levels. There's weird, weird color schemes as you move up and down the levels <laughs> as well. Like you you've swamp, not been to the purple log section before. <laughs> yeah. Then the next one's blue. Then there's a green one. It's like what? And the sprites Easy get delete. weird. Yeah, they do. <laughs> it's just odd. But it, but the thing is, yes, you can move them down there, but it makes a very little difference because it's exactly the same in every level. Yep. There's nothing different. You should try and hunt down the 35 glowing flowers. 35? No one's going to do that. No. The music is the type to, it's tonally the type to slowly drive you mad. <laughs> it's, awful. It's, it's good that we both n- noted upon that because it's, it's just it's really loud and uh, <laughs> it's just it's obnoxious it's making me angry thinking about it because it I- is it's one of those <laughs> sort of music sort of thing where it's like you just you turn your send your speakers off and then you just put them on to as soon as you can hear them but it's instantly loud there's there's, yeah. a, there's no subtlety it's like, it's like no, ah, oh, no yeah. hang on this must be you know point zero and zero 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 one is just still dead, dead loud you can't do yep. anything about this you can have nothing or you know drill in your head you're going to um, feel the power of those sawtooth waveforms and the, <laughs> yeah, because, sp- the pulse it, width waveforms you're going to pulse into your brain <laughs> it's the sound effects as well they're, I put they're loud and vicious <laughs> they are <laughs> it's horrible the gameplay <laughs> element of 
having your head explode is what I felt like playing it. Yes, I felt exactly. Like, yeah, that's what I think that's what it is because you get swarmed by the things I on every f- level. Yeah, I forgot that. Yeah, um, and then your head explodes. The only way to get rid of them is by finding the gap to go up to the other level. Um, yeah. You know, you can't swap them away or anything. You just got to find a way up Stupid. or down, and they go away. It's not really going to endear itself to the player. It's just you know noisy and dull. That's you know, our review. There's fifty four percent. They got they didn't play this. No. No, they didn't. <laughs> no, no way you could give this 54% if you played it. Not nope. a cat in hell's chance. No, nope. the review is oh. far too flippant. Yeah, it's all right, whatever. It's kind of average, this game. Yeah, it looks all right. I mean, it's from players, isn't it? And No mention of the audio that's possibly turning me into a psycho. <laughs> right, as we, I'm still, I can hear it in my head. It's like a, once you, you yeah. can't unhear that music. No, no. <laughs> it's, it's It sounds funny. No, it doesn't. No, it's, it really doesn't. No, it doesn't. <laughs> It's, I feel like uh, I feel like that moment in um, uh, Logan's Run where he's just sat in that thing with that thing going. There is no sanctuary. There is it's that music playing. Sanctuary, sanctuary. sanctuary. I'm like, I'm just feel, I feel like I'm trapped in that with me. Just my head's spinning around in circles. It's renew. <laughs> I just tell you, that's what he does to you. What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I got swamp fever. That's because that's where the uh, plankton came from. Um, and <laughs> sea greens and plankton <laughs> <laughs> came from the swamp. Fish and plankton, sea greens and protein from the sea, and then it stopped coming, and they came instead. <laughs> So and then they stopped the coming. Plankton <laughs> and see, I'm gonna to to put that stupid sound in now. <laughs> oh, now you've done it. I wonder if people, when they hear, sometimes listen to these random things we put into these things, they go, "What the hell are they on? Why? Why is that there? What does it even mean?" <laughs> it just well, means what that's it means. Just, it just means what it means. It's, it's it means it's what just it a means. Special. It's a, it's like having a special little moment. It's what playing games like Swamp Fever does to you. <laughs> it does. It actually. That's does what, bloody music it's horrible <laughs> so <laughs> let's move on quickly at last we've got one more for this section And if the, the, the music, Christ, these, this is a double bill. I was, my head was just all over the place. I, I had to go and have a lie down in a dark room for like about half an hour because I, I, I just felt, it. I felt quite ill. I didn't yeah. know what, I didn't know where I was. Revenge of the Mutant Camels 2. So straight out the swamp into Minter Madness. Now this is also called Revenge 2 and it's also called Return of the Mutant Camels. So depending on which one you see, it's all, it's, by the looks of it, just some research into it, it looks like it's all the same thing because it's the third entry in the Mutant Camels franchise. It sees Mi- Mr. Minter once again pit camels against just about everything you can think up as you make your way through <laughs> or try to 100 levels of constant blasting action so anyway after centuries of peaceful space hippying wandering the stars and considering what it is to wander lonely as a cloud mankind is under attack again by the warmongering Zyaxians who have launched their assault on the Terran homeworld uh, which I'm guessing is Earth the you and I um, anyway with no Johnny Commando or Bobby Rambo to call upon due to our constant galactic weed smoking <laughs> we have to resurrect the 6th thousand year old mutant camels and call upon them once again to save the day there you go that's the plot as it is um and this they attempt to do stomping resolutely from left to right and shooting and bombing all that comes in their way so yeah it's an evolution of the previous games uh it's very similar it's a left to right shooter where you are a camel and you are beset on every level by a random i can only describe it as a random brain explosion of objects from everyday life the range from floppy disks to telephone boxes to Y fronts to love hearts and everything else in between. <laughs> um, if you manage to clear a level, you will get some credits, um, which you can spend on weapon power ups for the next level, which adds perhaps some interesting strategy to it. But like all Minter games, this goes from fairly easy first level to an absolute vertical spike in difficulty in whatever you try next, like a difficult mountain. It's just yeah, yeah. yeah. The first yeah, one's dead easy, um, and then the, whichever one you can try next, it's like death. Oh, mm. hang on. Um, so the control of the camel doesn't work as you can walk along the floor. So I didn't really like it. But you can walk along the floor, and if you hold down the fire button, this allows you to fire in eight directions. And if you fire in the corners or up top right or anything like that, you'll walk slowly in the direction as well while you're shooting. And it keeps you tethered to the floor, basically. If you stop pressing the fire button, you can jump into the air and you hover. So as you hover, as you hammer the fire button, you'll stay in midair. Uh, and this also drops bombs, which hit the floor and then you know move along to kill everything. But you just don't... I couldn't anyway. I mean, that, and I've got a fairly fast fire button finger, but I just couldn't shoot fast enough to deal with the madness assaulting you. And the bombs I just found did jack shit. So you end up walking along the floor all the time trying to shoot everything, but that's rendered useless by enemies that are immune to your bullets. Like in the second level I tried, it was Pac-Man ghosts and Pac-Men, and the Pac-Men wouldn't get destroyed by the bullets. 
and all the bombs. So I didn't know what the hell I was supposed to do or how to avoid them. I couldn't I couldn't figure out a way to do it. I don't know whether I needed something off the power-up screen, but I'd, I'd obviously bought the wrong thing, so I couldn't do it. So I was like, oh, you just shred your health bar in seconds and we lose one of your five lives and it's, and it's out the level. And the, like we said about red, red LED earlier on, once you've tried one of these screens, because there's a map screen basically, like a 10 by 10 grid, and you start at the top left and that's the first level, so there's 100 levels. When you clear that, you can go down or across. So you can... I, I, you can move into the next level to what you want to play depending on where you are but if you fail there's a little cross appears on it and you can't redo that one so you have five lives any level you fail is complete uh, fails complete is inaccessible and if you do fail you lose that i could see any bullet power-ups you may have bought um, and you also don't get any credits to buy some more so it's a double whammy of punishment for for trying for trying levels which are nigh on impossible. And I'm not talking levels further down the line. This is levels two or three or whatever they are. If you go to level two, it's death. Level one below it, death. And being right at the start, it's like ease me in. So like all Minter games, we've said this time and time again. I appreciate the technical aspects. There's a lot going on. There's all the crazy madness and there's colours and blasting and the shooting and it's all very smooth and very fast. But it's just a mess. It's a mess of stuff thrown in each level. And like all Minter games before, I just find myself bemused, frustrated, and I just ultimately find myself turned off by the whole thing. Um, and I, that's it. I can't I can't get on with these games. They just do my head in. Maybe it's coming straight up for Swamp Fever, but I don't think so because I tried it before. And I just don't get on with Minter's stylings. I just can't. I just don't. They're not for me. I know some people do. And that's fine. But I, I, I really didn't like this because I just don't think it's very playable. And I can, you know, I'm sure people go, no, it is. You just got to do it this way. It's like, but it's so unforgiving and so punishing from the get-go like, oh, having to do that heart level time it's boring no not for me never liked him never will what about you um into game where you control a camel shooting in multiple directions yay it's just what i asked for <laughs> uh, for christmas i had that on my christmas list um no i didn't <laughs> i don't generally get on with jeff minter games at all i've not liked any i don't think really that we've played so far or not to any great degree i think it was Iridis. is it redis 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 alpha, alpha. redis alpha is probably I'm... the only one that i sort of had a bit of time for maybe i'm sipital only... Um, I, no, I say okay. no. Uh, but th- and there's never anything inherently wrong with them. I have to say they're kind, they're well coded. They're just crazy, colourful, fast paced. Those are all good things. I just can't find a way to get into them. For me, the novelty of the whole camel thing is completely lost on me. Totally, yeah, mm-hmm. doesn't work. I'm like, oh, so there's a camel in the game, and and it's often it's too often stroboscopic in its kind of gameplay, and it's just I just don't like those kind of things. In all fairness, this is a little bit toned down, a little bit from some of the other crazy, colourful, you know, mind-boggling things. And it is three quid, and so perhaps there's quite a bit there. There's a lot of shooty game in here to oh, go yeah, at yeah. three quid. I'm not saying but, there isn't. No, but it's mindless. It's silly. It's not buggy. Works great, but it's just I've never, with perhaps the exception of of his version of Tempest on the Atari Jaguar never really liked much of his output at all on anything and this isn't really any different for me I've said it before if you like as you've just said actually if you like Jeff Minter games then this is probably another worthwhile budget addition to your collection and it certainly is just kind of plug and play so you can just load this up and away you go you're not going to have any super super pretense or crazy crappy story or space batteries required from the universal god knows what or marbles piling up to you know <laughs> you don't get any of that stupid st- stupid stuff but I don't know. I think for me, I'm beginning to like a little bit more sophistication and production in my games. And as much as these are well made, they just feel a little bit bodged and a bit just sort of thrown together. And that's just not, that's not the style I can dig. So somebody, somebody will like it. It got a a whopping 90% in Zap which mm. all right but they have a bit of a love affair with him don't they and that's fair enough maybe maybe because it is in another in another if i had a different hat on i might very well like it and be raving about it but i just never found a way into these games so it's not for me but it is three it is a three quids a bargain really for it yeah it, it is but i can't imagine what that had hat would need to be you to like um it. i would like to say it was a top hat but in the shape of a space rocket <laughs> in the shape of y fronts <laughs> That's that's my sunglasses. <laughs> oh, Ray Ban. Just to be clear, I, I don't wear Y fronts for sunglasses. I actually own a real pair of sunglasses, but I'm now tempted to do that. Well, I don't me, know where you buy Y fronts from anymore. Do they even think make you those anymore? Do think too much? Do they make Y fronts still? Do they make Y fronts? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> How would I know? <laughs> How, why would I know? <laughs> you, just look, you, you look that kind of guy that might know. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> That you, you wear white my pants <laughs> again. I told you about that. Generation Z have Z pants, of course. That's of course, yeah. Mm-hmm. Really, really hard to like have a pee through. <laughs> that is not the way they want to advertise them. I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, on that uh, panty bombshell. <laughs> 
panty. I hate that word. Um, <laughs> um, let's move along. I don't want to think about panties and Jeff Minter in the same here, same same no. sort. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. But it's you know technically clever, but it's more Minter. If you like that, yeah, it's yeah. your if it's your thing. Exactly. There we go. It's not been a great half of games. I'm not sure it's no. going to get much better later on. Should we take a break? Um, let's I have need one after that. Still got that stupid music in my head. <laughs> well, speaking of music, we'll be back after this, where we'll be looking at music from October 1987. So, uh, yeah, stick around. <laughs> Massive Sunday roast dinners and Yorkshire puddings to our wonderful show sponsor, DavidHerdenWriter.com, where you will find a whole load of brilliant audiobooks, bargain books, ebooks, and more. David's latest amazing book, Escape from the Commodore 64, is available right now. In fact, let's go and have a sneaky listen. It would be rude not to. On this screen, you'll see the approaching target, city, whatever. Not even I know what to call it. I just know we need to take out as many of the bad guys as possible. More baddies destroyed equals more money and keys for us. Then we can buy our way out of here and into the next game. Right. Sarah gave a firm nod. I think I remember Reese playing this one. He was obsessed with it. I don't remember it being a shoot 'em up. It was more a, I don't know, virtual 3D world. Well, Nell said, apparently the new mayor has made some changes, adding more action than the programmer intended. Sarah looked at her blankly. In other words, he's made our lives harder. Now that is a spicy meatball. Escape from the Commodore 64 is available right now. Don't listen to me yakking. Head to davidhernwriter.com to find out more. We're back, we're back, we're back. We're back with music. Um, in October 1987. So what we got going on? Loads going on, as per normal. Some of these we have spoken about before, but let's see what we've got. Number one, for one week, uh, still was Pump Up the Volume, uh, and Annie Tina, whatever it is, the first time I see the dance, um, by Mars, for the first week. Pump Up the Volume, Pump Up the yeah. Volume. Fifteen songs were sampled in that. There's 15? a list on there. Fifteen songs make wow. up. Wow. Well, if you think about it, that pretty much is the whole of that song. <laughs> well, yeah, I know, yes. It's a house track, in it? But I know. Yeah. 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 That's, a, that's a lot of songs. None yes, of them I, is. I, I, will, I will put the list of songs that's, uh, that's from uh, whosampled.com. It's such a great website. And um, I'll put the list on the show notes or something. Or maybe yeah. just the link to, who, to the whosampled.com or something. But, All yeah. right. Um, for the last three weeks, we've spoken about it before, but uh, the Bee Gees climbed all the way up to number one with You Win Again. <laughs> hey. We win again. They did. <laughs> Giant! <laughs> so, we win again. Oh, what is best in life? <laughs> Captain before you! <laughs> Barry Gibb, what is best in life? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong! <laughs> that is good. Yeah, uh, yes. Oh, Barry Gibb actually, is like um... in that gladiator sp- scene. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> I want to see uh, C- Conan the BG Barbarian. <laughs> Barry the Barbarian. Barry, <laughs> Barry the Barbarian. Brilliant. That'd be brilliant. That would be good. Um, yeah, I've not got a lot to say about this. We've said it before, haven't we? Yeah, 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 we have. Yeah, I was just going to say, then, that we'll put a, a show note link to the utterly stupid um, yeah. sort of... Um, <laughs> someone's done a version of it where they've sort of dubbed over the lines with uh, silly lyrics, one of which is, we <laughs> we do nothing but corned beef. Anyway, I'll, I'll just watch the, watch the video. It'll give you a chuckle if nothing else. Yeah, they'd quite make me laugh we some of that. We do nothing but corned beef. Anyway, yeah, that. <laughs> Uh, we've got four four albums. Um, there was mm. a num- number new number one every week. So the first week we've spoken about before uh, there was "Bad" by Michael Jackson. Yeah. Uh, then the following that there was "Tunnel of Love" uh, by Aye. Bruce Springsteen. Um, I'll speak a bit of the video when we get to. I think there's singles out of that as well. Then we ha- no, it's not. Is it? So um, I looked at the single. I don't know if the single for this is out yet, but I looked at the single for this "Tunnel of Love." Um, it's a hat, hat, It's a monochrome video. With what looks like Bruce, he's standing in a building, not a tunnel. Right. 
which annoyed me. Um, the building also, of love would have a different connotation, I think. Well, exactly as well. And he also gets scared by the tide in the opening. Mm-hmm. So it's worth watching just to see him sort of, the tide comes in as he's walking on the beach and he runs away quite scared. So, you know, so much for oh, Bruce tide. Springsteen being tough. <laughs> yeah, He's, he's to... not tough. He's scared of his own shadow. <laughs> so I've heard. The um, Springsteen shadow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like his evil the... nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> they speak of it in awe and wonder in the darker parts, in the in the tunnels of death. In the tunnels of death, there lies the Springsteen shadow. <laughs> it's like if you see the Springsteen shadow in the month of April, then three months of darkness shall appear. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. true. Be careful out there. Be careful out there. Be careful. Um, replacing that next week was Nothing Like the Sun by Sting. Which is true because that album is nothing like the sun. It's not because it's in the Bruce Springsteen shadow. So it's a second, his second solo album. Apparently, it explores the genres of pop rock, soft rock, jazz, reggae, world, acoustic rock, dance rock, and funk rock. It's a lot of different kinds of rock. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cleethorpes rock, Blackpool, Blackpool. rock, <laughs> Morecambe rock, South End rock. So there's so many rocks Brighton. we're missing. Brighton rock, yeah. Moon, <laughs> Moon rock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Nothing like the sun. None of those things are. <laughs> it's not. Silly uh, sting. You silly sting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> replacing that for the final week, of course, was Tango in the Night by Fleetwood Mac. Aye, uh, not a fan. Oh, you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying anything more about Fleetwood just, Mac. <laughs> just in case you uh, don't remember, I just thought I'd say that. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I didn't. Let's move into singles. Uh, 4th of October, in at number 34, was Strong as Steel by Five Star. Yep. Um, that picture you've put in there sort of thing, the the one on the left and the one second from the right, look like they've had their cheekbones surgically augmented. Yeah, that's that's heavy makeup on there, yeah. on that picture. I mean, there's a couple of things. It's a, it's, they're, I mean, they're an amazing looking group, Five Star. They're not my cup of tea at all. And they seem to always be around in the chance at this time. We've not, yeah. I think in the last few episodes, there's just been a Five Star album or track. So, what, yeah. How prolific are these? They're, they can't be stopped. They're, just, they're, they're at gunpoint. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, but the the reason I put that picture in there is one because it's an amazing picture. But two, if you look at how photoshopped images were at that time, it's the early days of Photoshop, and you can tell they've gone mad on the photo filters. It's like goodness me, slow down, Egghead, on the old filter in there. <laughs> You've smoothed them out of all recognition. <laughs> it's they smoothed their faces off. Ridiculous level of smoothing. I mean, that guy yeah. on the left is so smooth. His hair's gone smooth. <laughs> It's a from massive smoothing of the It's been it's been smoothened. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't get past the cheekbones. I like I could open well, letters on them. Well, that's the strongest steel, that's what they are. They can actually uh, open bottles of beer on them. Which is <laughs> handy so. if you're out of them. And if you're ever out and see them, you go, Can you open this for us? You're like, Yeah, of course I can, mate. Crack, crack, there yeah. we go. On his cheek. Yeah. Oh, that's uh that's quite the, that's quite the uh, trick that's quite you the have skill. There. <laughs> yeah. Ice being five star. See ya. <laughs> Thanks for opening what? that for us. Who was that smooth man? <laughs> he was so smooth. Was He'd so been smooth. smoothened. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, not as smooth at number 41. Maybe tomorrow by UB40. Not for me. Never tomorrow for them. <laughs> oh, yeah, they can bog off as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I don't like Emma. I don't no, like MOR reggae. Not my yeah. thing at all. No, it's not. Uh, number 44 was Dance Little Sister by Terence Trent Darby. Yeah. Do you really Britain's think a, he's Brit? Do you really well, think then, he's- if you watch that video, it's clear that that's the, where they were trying to pitch him, Britain's answer to Prince. I mean, he is a, talent, a very talented guy, Terence Trent Darby, you know, at that time. And, you know, he was very charismatic, very, you know, a good-looking young guy, kind of an interesting mm. voice. Um, I feel like the guy in that kick advert, you're going to go a long way, mate. But he, <laughs> he, he, was, uh, he, was, he was just in that link to print is very very implicitly demonstrated i think in that video which again we'll put all of this stuff in the show notes so yeah i thought so um it is odd though that at the beginning of that, i don't know if you noticed he seems to have a conversation with the saxophone yes um in the because he goes do 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 and then you go, bah, 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 bah. Do, do, well, he, can, do, do, do. he can speak fluent saxophone it's fluent very difficult fact, yeah yeah uh, absolutely yeah. i wonder what he's saying to it i'd like to know well you'd have to understand the nuances of trumpet <laughs> And sax, because it's they're all different languages. It's not just the music. It's that there's an entire. I mean, as we know, our favourite friend Herb Albert. <laughs> yeah, Herb Albert. <laughs> our favourite friend Herb Albert. He speaks fluent trumpet, doesn't he? He does. Yes, um, absolutely. Although you have to uh, have surgical um, procedures if you want to speak pure bassoon. <laughs> you actually do. Yeah, very, very, it's really very painful. Tight. Um, number forty-six, "Love in the First Degree" by Bananarama. Ugh. The stabby trumpets. The trumpets. The pain, <laughs> the bad. pain. There's loads of them in that. 
They're all right. <laughs> Too many trumpets. Pete Walkman variously claimed he had come up with the idea for that song while in the bath. And after waking up one morning with a tune in his head, if it was near me, he'd be waking up one morning with an axe. Than a tune, <laughs> Did but... he wake up in the bath? Uh, well, that's why you got to connect those two things. Apparently none of it's true, though, because Sarah Daling, one of the bananas, <laughs> stated that he was not present during the song's composition at all. Lying. Yeah. Lying monkey. You little Absolutely. monkey. Anyway, um, yeah, you like that I, song, apparently. I do. I, I listen to it. I quite like the song. It's, it's catchy. Do you know, but I was looking at yeah. Bananarama. They are in the Guinness Book of Records for yeah, yeah. having the most... Uh, con- most uh, top 50 tracks in the UK for an all-girl band. Yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're really crazy popular. So, is it 30 or 50? 30, I think. Over yeah, yeah. 30 Loads singles. They all sound exactly the same, no wonder. Probably well, can't tell yeah. the difference. Indeed. Um, number 51, The Right Stuff by Brian Ferry. <laughs> what a sophisticated song that is, it's isn't it? massive sophistication of the uh, music in it. Sophistic- sophisticated, it's crazy. Yep. Do you know, it renders Brian Ferry only capable of singing in the angst-ridden drone sounds and warbles that he's paying for. I noticed for. that, yeah. Just watching this made me grab some mirrored sunglasses, throw on a T-shirt, sports jacket and jeans, buy a pair of espadrilles, and go for a tequila sunrise and a swarthy cocktail lounge and ask a woman <laughs> at the bar in breathy tones if she could feel it. Didn't end well, that. <laughs> it never does. No. It never does. I'm it's a married man. It, went, it all went wrong. <laughs> it all went esp- wrong. It's the espadrilles, man. I keep telling you about them. I know, they're too thumpy on my feet. I can't wear espadrilles. <laughs> that's just your like feet. A, I know, that's what I mean. I've got, <laughs> they it's call like you old a, thumpy feet. <laughs> it's like putting, 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 putting them on a hobbit's feet. It's not very nice. <laughs> He just burst out the end. Just massive this, toes. This is is the reason why espadrille sales are really low in the Shire. <laughs> so, and I live in the Shire. So you do, you do. Uh, but yeah, it is very sophisticated. That I did watch it yeah. and was like, oh, so I, I, I felt myself really. I felt myself like changing. I didn't. Well, quite you've like got. It. Did you suddenly develop like a long, thin black tie? Because I did. I didn't even have one on when I started watching it. I don't know where that came from. I'm just... <laughs> It's just part of the uh, part of the ferry chain. Part of the power, the the ferry power, <laughs> pure ferry power. <laughs> the ferry change. He's going through the ferry change. Look out! <laughs> Look out! <laughs> He'll have a jacket on next. You start seeing that. Like, <laughs> oh no! He's on full ferry. Get him out of here quick! <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, <laughs> number 55 is Don't Stop. No, Do Stop. Don't Stop by the LA Mix. Yeah, just LA Mix with Mike Stevens, Les Adams, Emma Freelick. No idea who they are at all. No, That's just no. Oh, no. An early house track, not very good. Yeah. Um, number 66 is Let the Happiness In by David Sylvian. Mm, do you know much about David Sylvian? I do not, no. He's put, he's, he was in the band Japan. Yeah, he's the principal songwriter and yeah. frontman. So I've noted that there is no happiness in this song, there is despite no. saying let the happiness in. And I feel he was challenged by Black and their track Wonderful Life to see if he could trump them <laughs> with an even more oxymoronic song. And he did. <laughs> he did. Yes. In fact, he, he doesn't w- let any happiness in. There's no, because, just... you know, Wonderful Life is not happy. And then no. he's, well, can you beat that? <laughs> hold my <laughs> Hold my hold my sad beer. <laughs> hold my going in. Half, hold my half empty glass. Because it could be just keep the happiness out, couldn't it? Really, it kept my happiness out. That's, that's for sure. I mean. Listening to that. Yeah. First single from his album Secrets of the Beehive. <sighs> he didn't name that album himself. Clearly, no. What are the Secrets of the Beehive? Stupid name. I don't know, but apparently very unhappy places. I mean, about I to be. Thought, I thought they were quite happy, but what do I know? I don't know. It's full of workers, you know. Yeah, doing their thing. Um. Number 81, Easy Lady. Yeah. <laughs> that, that sounds like a command. <laughs> <laughs> easy Lady. Hey, you go Easy Lady. <laughs> by um, Spagna. By Spag- Spagna. It's good old Spagna. Spag- this is Spagna terrible. Bolognese. Spagna. It sound, sh- sounds like it should be Spanish, but she's Italian, I think. Yeah. But, um, well, or is it I, Italian? I, so. I don't know. I, I don't thought know. she was from Nottingham. Because that's where she films yeah. her videos. Yeah, she does seem to really like the Midlands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And the trumpets again. Of course, it's going to have stabby trumpets and the hair. My goodness me, the hair. Yep. And did you notice that during this video, it looks like her mouth is actually animatronically <laughs> controlled. Uh, I did notice. Yeah. If you look around the one minute point, and again, we'll put the video in the show notes. It's like she's miming badly anyway, but it's like someone else is controlling her mouth, like a like a uh, a puppet in a show. Yeah. It's, really weird. It, it ain't good. It's a bit yeah. shit, really. This, this song was crap. Yeah. Was and then she cracks. She cracks open a water bump and squirts somebody. Very suggestive, isn't it? That. Oh, very. Yeah, yeah, it's crap. Um, 11th of October, number 20, was Rain in the Summertime by The Alarm. (laughs) So many mullets. The bass mullet was the one that got me. Full on, God. 
Wow. Um, and you were right. I've never actually really listened to that, but when it started, I was like, is this a U2 cover? Is, there yeah, a is, YouTube- is he channeling U2? <laughs> yeah. Um, so what was going on with them? It's little U2, isn't it? It is li- <laughs> little U2. Yes, it is exactly that. Or they're a mullet-only tribute band. Well... So well, they either cover bands that have mullets or they're a mullet band that only covers, <laughs> not that the mullet band is even a thing, but they're a mullet <laughs> well, band. It should be. But um, <laughs> I think that alarms should have been raised when they walked into the uh, record, uh, you know, record studio, record company sort of thing, and, and put on Irish accents, because they're Welsh, the alarm, and yeah. put on Irish accents and tried to tell them that the lead singers was called Bino, um, <laughs> and on guitar we had Ledge. Um, with Les, <laughs> what's, the, what's the other one's called? Adam, what, Adam, he's called Les. What's the uh, Larry Mullen, isn't it? Super so Larry Mullet, Barry Mullet. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Um, so it's you know, alarm bell should have rang. Um, yes. maybe it did, and that's why they got called the alarm. But this just did sound like U2, yeah, terrible. Um, Not very good U2 either. Little, it was a little U2, you're very right. That's right, yep. yeah, little yeah, U2. little U2, nearly brand U2. <laughs> Absolutely, can't believe it's not you too. I said, go and enjoy a pack of puffins. <laughs> get 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 some Norpak spread on your bread. Um, I bought some choco choco nut today. Choco, choco nuts. nuts. Choco nuts. To be they're fair, like, they're Snickers. Yeah, well, they will be, say, say what you want about the, the nearly brands, but I would opt for a good pack of Wacko biscuits <laughs> any day of the week. Yeah, absolutely. Over, Rock, over Rocky Robbins. Yeah, <laughs> who, who wouldn't? Um, yeah, crispy crock yeah. all the way. Uh, can't believe it's not you too. What else is there? You two, you utterly delicious. Anyway, number <laughs> thirty-five, just like heaven by the Cure. Ugh, no, it's, it's, it was, this was. I mean, I'm not a, obviously a, a huge fan of the Cure. There are songs I like by them. I think some of them are okay. But this just felt like it was almost like they've been programmed to. Like someone went right, you, you guys, be a bit programmed a computer to play like the Cure, and it was just them by numbers. The same sort of, you know, dum 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 da dum 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 bass style, the jangly guitar, the, then the simple synth line, then his voice that collapses as he hits notes. Uh, just by the numbers and yeah, by the it numbers works. I think no. it's a catchy single but it's no, a lot it's um, it's a, it is a lot more up tempo than a lot of their album stuff but they had I don't know I'm trying to think of when stuff like The Forest and early stuff like that was out but right the cure for your peril I mean you've got Disintegration coming soon so um, I don't like it's, him I think, it's a, I think that just this. I do like some cure that one just felt very I it was like almost it. them it, by numbers yeah. like paint by numbers version I like it when they've been a bit, a little bit more challenging mm. Number 58, I Promise You by Samantha Fox. Oh, this stupid thing. <laughs> stupid, <laughs> stupid thing. This is bad, isn't it? It's bad. Yeah. It's another one. It's, an, it's, it's another, another one. It's bad. There's lo- lots of bad things about this video. I didn't realise she had such a prolonged career in music. I thought They really I, gave it a go, didn't they? God bless they really her. She did. really did I mean, give really it She tried. gave it her all. Well, she gave it her all, but she was surrounded by imbeciles. Who yeah, because said, actually it was crap. a good idea. Let's let's colour everything in on this crappy video and take you to wherever I, what arcade it was and badly draw over the actual arcade name. Yeah, it's like yeah, as I found that someone found the Quantel paint box and hit every oh, button they, they could. Just, the song is really really bad as well, isn't it? Really bad, like bad bad. So yep. I think this is the worst video yet out of all of them. Like you said, Quantel paint box hit everything and paint something on it with that horrible squiggly squiggly style that was kind of popular around that time a little bit in kids TV shows anyway. Yes. Um, um, so yeah, like like you put a, a crap version of Take on Me. Yeah, <laughs> as you've written, take a shit on me. Yeah. Don't think that would have sold as many. Um, but you never know. We would have had the follow-up singles, The Sun Always Shits on TV, Shitting High and Low, and Cry Wolf, I've Shit Myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Sam Fox would uh, would have approved of any of those titles, but and again, there's no, less wind in this video, even though she was on the coast, I noticed. Uh, she was, yeah, and it has that really, really terrible arcade bit. Yeah, where nobody goes. It's an arcade at night where there isn't anybody. It's kind of no. weird. Well, they had to film it when it, no, you know, otherwise she would have been mobbed for her shoes. Uh, yeah, 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 she would have been. Yeah. Mm. Um, number 65, Genius Move by That Petrol Emotion. No, strange though, isn't it, this? A London-based <laughs> Northern Ireland originating band with a North American vocalist. Complex. <laughs> Very <laughs> complex. Not the, complex ex- not the most complex we'll hear to, uh, no, in this no, episode. No, not, not by far, <laughs> but the ex-members of The Undertones are in there, um, oh. and this single was never actually put onto an album, so it's just a single single. Yeah. Not very non-plus about it, very forgettable. Yeah. Um, number 86 was Birthday by The Sugar Cubes. Do you like The Sugar Cubes? God, no. I never, well, I'm glad I never, you said that. I never dug Bjork. She never did no. anything for me, and I asked no. her multiple times. She wouldn't pick up after herself. <laughs> It's always a nightmare. <laughs> no, I'm not a fan. I've listened to both versions, the English and the Icelandic version, and I hated both of them. Yes. Discord and off-key warbling from some kind of living anime. 
<laughs> That's a good way to describe her, yeah. Yeah, everyone was raving about Bjork, weren't they, in the thought when she came back as a solo artist in like, the middle of Britpop, oh, and I was like, oh, just... this is awful. Didn't dig it. I didn't dig it at all. Although, although, she did some great videos later on when she met Chris Cunningham. And that rabbit hole led me to watch, uh, rewatch the Apex Twin video for Come to Daddy. And I am literally still traumatized by it right now. Because I forget how horrible that video actually is. Yeah. That's the, is, that the, is that the big thing screaming into the old woman's yeah, face? Yeah, yeah. I'll eat your soul. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. And all the little, all the little kids running around with his face on, the masks. It's just horrible. It's, it everything about weird. that video is disturbing. It is very much so. Um, let's move on quickly. Number 89, Give Me Your Love by MSG. <laughs> the Macaulay Schenk, is it Schenker? How you say that? Schenker? Yeah, Macaulay Schenker group, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Sound like a solicitor's. Do lots of big or, hair in that, isn't there? Big, massive. Ooh, and then some. Big hair. Big hair, very back backlit, very rock cliche. And it's like they're impersonating or channeling Def Leppard in that particular song, at least. I thought they sounded, sounded like when he started singing like a shit poison. And they were ugly. Yeah, it's, it was more the chorus parts that reminded me of Def Leppard, where they do yeah, very maybe. much like animal, very like animal, that. Ugly yeah. lot, aren't they? <laughs> ugly, really, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And their bio for this is complicated. This is verbatim. The band featured an eclectic mix of musicians in terms of nationalities. Macaulay hails from Ireland originally, while Schenker and drummer Bodo Schopf are both from Germany. American guitarist Mitch Perry, a.k.a. Mitch Brownstein from the band The Kids, originally played in bass virtuoso Billy Sheehan's band, Talas. And I'd later joined the revamped Australian-American version of the band Heaven, while bassist Rocky Newton and guest keyboardist rhythm guitarist Steve Mann were British and had previously been members of the band Lionheart. <laughs> Mann would officially join the band for MSG's next album, Replacing Perry. Complicated, yeah. that. It's like, it's like the worst kind of family tree you've ever seen. Yeah, it's never, I don't think it's good as well, um, having uh, just like, got, you know, overproduced crap as you put, just like food with MSG in it. Yeah. Um, it's never a good thing to have your initialism be the same as a food additive that people don't want in their food. No, you know, why, no one wants monosodium glutamate. It? Why initialize yourself to MSG as well? It is stupid, isn't it? Yeah, you're yeah, right. You're absolutely Because Macaulay right. Schenker Group sounds like an insurance or a sales brand. It does, sales it does brand. actually, yeah. So just, you know, give yourself something. There's so Macaulay's many names they could have name. given themselves. Yeah, Lionheart <laughs> too. <laughs> Talas. If you can call you Tala, name Ban Talas, anything's on the table as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, call, them, call yourself the new originals. <laughs> the new heaven. The new Talas. <laughs> Talas 2. This time it's musical. <laughs> oh, this time less bass. Uh, 18th of October, number 10, Faith by George Michael. Dink, a dink, a dink. Jink, jink. Yeah, good old. It's a great song, actually. That it is a good song. But as you've rightly pointed out, <laughs> the best yeah. version of this. Yeah, Vic Reeves. Yeah, and stars in their eyes. It's the, we'll put the video on the YouTube. Well, it's Bob Mortimer in it. It's, yeah, it's Bob. I can't. I can't hear that song and not <laughs> see that image of you look not like him. <laughs> um, what's his name, Bob? Um, Oh God! What is it? It's, um, I'm, Bob I'm a murderer, and, and I'm, I'm a murderer. Oh, uh, we don't murder this song. <laughs> <laughs> it's just brilliant, brilliant. We'll put it's from the smell. I think it's is it the smell of Reeves and Brom? I can't reach. Yes, it's Reeves and Brom. Anyway, we'll put we'll put the video clip in the show notes. But it's just I can't hear that song and not see that image now. So forever, yeah. see, right? It erased George Michael's video out of my mind forever. That. Yep. Um, <laughs> number seventeen, Rent by the Pet Shop Boys. Told you. I told you, yeah. didn't I? Neil, Neil Tennant, Rent. Yeah. yeah, it's all connected. Yeah, and I re- realised, I don't know if I said this last time, but if their name is a command, Pet Shop Boys. <laughs> Who the shop boys are is a tale to be told at another time. We don't want to know. We don't uh, want to know. I'm sure we'll come up with something. I, I really hate that song, though. I really hate it. Rent. Yeah, I, listen, I went back and listened to it. I tried I to like force that. myself it, but no. I do. No. I like that song. I just um, everything I wanted to. Never, never, no. Long, long time ago, a long time ago, friend of the podcast and I, Gary, wrote, did a did an uh, a rewrite of the lyrics for that um, right. from the point of view of rising damp, and we called it Rigsby's okay. rise, Rigsby's rising rent. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And I have that. I had those lyrics somewhere, but they're, unfortunately, they are a bit questionable in places. So yeah, so you uh, can't reproduce them nowadays. You can't reproduce them. <laughs> but um, yeah, there was a line. It was just something along the lines of "You can't keep a woman like Miss Jones waiting for long" or something. Um, but he was trying to get his rent out of Alan um, mm. or whoever it was. Anyway, there you go. Number thirty, Beethoven. I love to listen to by the Rhythmics. Yeah, that song was just absolutely horrible. Horrible. Yeah. yeah. Terrible fall from grace. And I, I don't get it. You've got a singer as capable as Annie Lennox. Why would you create that p- 
piece of garbage. Mm. Why? Why would it's you do that? A, it sounded like awful craft work. Yeah. You know, nonsense. But just really bad. Really, really just bad. Just her, her talking through something. I'm like, why? She's got such a great voice. Annie Lennox, why would you do that? Why? Don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's the mystery. It's, it's almost as mysterious as the next song's lyrics. <laughs> yeah, they are crazy. Uh, number 43, China in Your Hand by Tapao. Yeah. Go on, I'll let you read them. I'm not I'm not going to read them all out because I, I can't. It's like a riddle that can't be answered. Well, it can because it's a song about Frankenstein. So, no, it, it, is. it was a th- It was a theme she had on a scheme he had told in a foreign land. Yeah. To take life on earth to the second birth and the man was in command. It was a flight on the wings of a young girl's dreams that flew too far away. Don't push too far your dreams are China in your hand. Don't wish too hard because they may come true and you can't help them. You don't know what you might have set upon yourself, China in your hand. Yeah, exactly. If you don't if you're not getting Mary Shelley from that, I don't know what you're reading. No, I'm not getting that at all. <laughs> uh, okay. Still, in spite of all that, and I know you're maybe not a massive fan of it, I am a huge fan. This is a glorious song as far as I'm concerned. Oh, this is amazing. Oh God, no. um, even manages to pull off a decent sax solo. I love China in Your Hand. There was a lot of big sax solos in around this time in the 80s. Yeah, strangely it, was, it was the time of the sax. Remember, you just had Lost Boys. I still believe. And prior to that, you remember, do you remember Breaking Glass? Do you remember that crazy sax solo in Breaking yes. Glass by thingy? My God, what's it? Who was it who sang Breaking Glass? Um, um, Hazel, o- was Hazel, Hazel O'Connor. O'Connor, yeah. And that had yes. an amazing sax solo in it as well. Did. But yeah, no, I love China in your hand. Uh, I still I enough. still actually have the seven inch single of that. Smash it. I mean don't. Look after it. No, that. I'm not smashing it. Smash it. It's no, um it's the story of Frankenstein. It's the it's, it you is. know, it's the it's the um abridged notes. So whenever I have to write about them, I just quote that and it's like, oh my well, god. Well it didn't bloody help me when I was playing the game, Frankenstein, I can tell you that. Well that's because there's no mention of wasting your life way up a tree waiting <laughs> for a bear to run off a cliff. Oh there's a so, lyrics uh, that should be in it. <laughs> Right. You don't know what you might have set upon yourself. Piffling bear. I'm going to while away my day in the tree. Oh, the agony of it all. <laughs> uh, number 44, I've Got My Mind Set On You by George Harrison. Written and composed by Rudy Clark originally, and re- originally recorded by James Ray in 1962, under the title, I've Got My Mind Set On You. Okay. Yeah. So this is a cover by... Ex Beetle, um, or a Beetle? Was he a Beetle when he died, or was he not a Beetle? I don't know. If that, I don't really how it works. I don't know. Are you always, always a Beetle? Once a Beetle, always like an American president. Once a Beetle, always a Beetle. <laughs> I always like. Actually, all fun aside, I actually always quite like George Harrison because I quite like the songs he wrote for Abbey Road, which is Here Come the Sun and Something. So I quite like those off that album. So there you go. Yeah, all right. I'm not. Here I'm Comes massive. the Sun is a lovely song. Really yeah. lovely song that is. Yeah. Uh, number forty-eight was Muscle Deep, nineteen eighty-seven, by Then Jericho. <laughs> I put this is utterly forgettable ass, and it also oh, yeah. sounds like a teenager's search from search term <laughs> in Pornhub. Don't want to think about that. <laughs> tuck, 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 muscle deep, click. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> what are you searching on this computer, Derek? <laughs> oh damn, we're not in incognito mode. <laughs> <laughs> Good lord! <laughs> Good lord, he's muscle deep. <laughs> Good lord, he's, that's what it means. Maybe this. <laughs> he's gone full then Jericho. <laughs> Fetch the lube, the good lube. <laughs> Not that cheap stuff. <laughs> I'm going in muscle deep. <laughs> oh. You're bloody well not, Derek. I'll tell you that. You're not. <laughs> oh, last time I ended up with China on my hand. <laughs> and then he bit the pillow in half. <laughs> not on your Nelly. <laughs> or anyone's Nelly. Oh, anyone's Nelly, no. Poor Nelly. Poor Nelly. Bloody. Come on, Mavis. Um, yeah, Muscle. It's not a great song, this. It's not. Um, <laughs> no, no. Back to the song, song is crap. Their only song that I... We're a couple of years away from actually a song that they do, which I actually really do like, uh, which is Big Area. Um, I don't know if you remember that one. Um, that was quite a good song they did, but nothing else they did was particularly good. Uh, number 58, mm. Need You Tonight by oh, NXS. Yeah. Dun, 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 did that one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it, uh, yeah. Uh, it's it's all right, isn't it? It's uh, it's another. I think it's Sophisto Rock. Yeah, Sophisto Rock, just down the coast from Scarborough. <laughs> I actually, I've, the song's initially quite interesting, isn't it? The good riff, and then it just gets really boring. It just does the same it just feels thing constantly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it never moves on. And he just he's really got to let you know. I'm like, well, tell me then. For, just tell me what. <laughs> God's sake, I've got yeah. to let yeah. you know. Well, then I'm not holding you back. Just you know, yeah. go for it. You, you're one of his kind. Which I, I don't know what that is. I mean, an incredibly charismatic frontman in an excess. I mean, goodness me, I, to be born to be that good looking and that talented is Mr. just unfair to the rest of us. Yeah, he's just unfair to the rest of us. He got he got my share <laughs> and mine. <laughs> he got a lot of people's shares. He got the full he got the full zap to the past quotient. He got the full whack, the full Monty. <laughs> 
<laughs> to do. <laughs> I want it back. <laughs> you can take it back. Oh, he's dead. I don't know he's I don't, dead. I don't, I don't want it now. Uh, it'll be a bit crusty. Number 75, <laughs> Blue Water by Fields of the Nephilim. Chirpy, wasn't it, that? It was a chirpy video. We um, it from a hanging noose. Yeah. <laughs> Did you watch any more of the video? He ends up in a cooking pot. Yeah, saw that as well. With the, I, I yeah. know it though. When he, when he was in the cooking pot, because obviously you don't really see the singer that often, but if he's, he's the singer, he looked really like Zed, Bobcat Goldthwait out of <laughs> Police did, Academy. He did. He did look like that. And then he said it. I'm like, oh my God, yes. <laughs> so it's like, Which that's why he wears all that, all that goth stuff. Because you've weird. got Bobcat. Because now we've got, in my head, I've got Bobcat Goldthwait <laughs> doing, it'd be good in The Cure with that voice. Yes. But not in Fields the Nephilim. You know. No. There we go. Uh, number 84, Get Down by Gay Bikers on Acid. And after watching this video, I wish it had stayed down. Yeah, that needs erasing from time and space. Yeah. It's not, not just aged well in every respect. It's disrespectful and, quite frankly, it's a, horrible. It's really There's, bad, There's it? no place for that kind of thing in this no. world anymore. No. Uh, number 91, I've Had the Time of My Life by Bill Medley and Jennifer Warnes. You know what that means? Dirty dancing. It's loose. It's loose. The boost. <laughs> it's it's, it's out there. It's loose. <laughs> it's loose. It's loose. Lots of gyrating hips. Absolutely. Patrick Swayze with a, with a bad rasta split. <laughs> Woman carrying a big melon or two melons. <laughs> yes. A, All kinds an, of things. And actual melons as well. Did you think when you watched this that Bill Medley uh, no. and Jennifer Warnes did, didn't look what you'd like you'd expect them to look like? No, I've asked because I've questioned you. What did you expect them to look like? They look like a pair of secondary school. Yeah, I don't know. They me. just seemed kind of just like two people. Just I don't know. I just thought they might be like these sort of Hollywood glamorous. They were just kind of like you said, just like two guy and a guy and a woman just kind of Absolutely. just got up and started singing. Well, Michael Hutchins had probably been round and sucked out the sex quotient from them. <laughs> That's what he just, did. You know, it's such a nice you know emotional song, and it's obviously for the film. It's quite you know sexy film and everything. Then that video would come and you'd be like, ah, I'm not going to see that there, innit? <laughs> Watching them two dirty dance with each other. Yeah, but just, it's not as bad as, remember uh, Joe Cocker sing that you know, one from Calito's Way? Oh, God. He so if you say. ever want a sort of mismatch between sexy song and singer, you know, <laughs> Joe Cocker doing that. anything. Yeah, ugh. true, true, so, true. There you go. At least these, you'd imagine he's having very business-like sex. Well, Joe Cocker sings with Jennifer Warnes, doesn't he? And up, up Where We Belong, I think, in the, for uh, their Officer he- and Gentleman. Yeah, there you go, yeah, see? I think it's Jennifer Warnes. None of this is good. No, you know what? Weirdly, when I saw Jennifer Warnes, in my mind I was thinking it was the woman out of Rocky. You no, know, Rocky's girlfriend, it isn't at all. What? I don't know Talia why I put Sh- those two together. Talia Shire. Yeah, I just thought it, but when she's in the pet shop in the first Rocky movie, she looks like that. Uh, a little bit. Yes, I can uh, see it. Anyway, some yeah. weird, weird things that your brain connects. <laughs> Indeed. 25th of no October, reason. number 11, Whenever You Need Somebody by Rick Astley. Yeah, it sounded exactly like the previous song. <laughs> Apart from not very good. No, it's not very good. Terrible. Rubbish. Yeah, really bad. Uh, well, perfect 20... example of the product, that is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's sore through and through, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Number 26 is Wanted by the Style Council. Um, yeah. they're, missing the, a... they're missing the word not from the start of that title. Absolutely. Give me a B, give me an L, give me an A, <laughs> give me an N, give me a D, and you can have the rest yourself. Yes, indeed. Number 38, Here I Go Again, 1987. A lot of 1987s um, by White Snake. Yeah, this is a interesting re-release of this compared. And I actually much prefer this version to the version that was released in 1982. Absolutely, yes. This is way um, better. And I just I like the solo better in this. I just like it better. So it's a good song. It's a good song. I'm not. There's lots of his face in this video. There's, there's <laughs> lots of sh- my- straight on face. Yeah, there's loads of straight faces. Also, I was never a fan of guitarists wearing bright red boots. He has got also, the old red boots on, hasn't he? Which is also in this video. But it's not the Wizard of Oz. But yeah, they're, they're really bright red, and I'm not a fan of that. But also as well, I always like this video as well for the opening section where it takes three of them to play that keyboard part. Yeah, yeah that bit with that, it highlights them all yeah, they're, from they're the all above. Back, they're all backlit. It's just backlit here. <laughs> three of them on it's keyboards. It's a big keyboard intro. It's a big keyboard intro, isn't I don't it? Think, I don't think you need three of them playing it. No, I don't think it's just for effect. I don't, think, I don't think none of them are actually playing it. They were just stood there. <laughs> Probably. Just backlit with smoke. Can you uh, imagine how, all those lights on them with all that hair lacquer? Like, that's a fire hazard. I'm surprised there wasn't more of that going around, you know, more more sort of big rock hair going up in flames in the 80s. Yeah. With all, all that light backlit stuff, all that, you know, all that hairspray. Flame there must have been terrible, terrible accident. And sweaty, sweaty pants. Sweaty pants. Because <laughs> they're only leather. Le- yeah, but they're leather. They're leather pants. Leather pants, very tight, skinny leather pants, sweaty leather and pleather. It's not nice. <laughs> What's pleather? <laughs> it's, it's plastic leather. It's fake leather, pleather. 
<laughs> Never heard of that. Plastic leather. Surely yeah, that's leather. Not, surely that's a. <laughs> it's like it's like leather. it's like leather effect. It's, it's not real cows. leather, but it's it, it looks like leather, but it's made of plastic. It's oh, leather. Looks like leather. Looks like it. <laughs> it looks like leather, but it's made of plastic. Pleather. <laughs> Get it from the world of pleather. <laughs> world of pleather. George Street. Mansfield. <laughs> you like pleather? You like plastic? You're going to love pleather. Pants, pleather. Trousers, pleather. Coats, pleather. Mustaches, pleather. Whatever the weather, pleather. <laughs> Hats, pleather. Hair, pleather. You can be full on pleather. As Frankie goes to Hollywood said, welcome to the pleather dome. <laughs> Oh, the power of pleather. <laughs> <laughs> when two tribes go to war, pleather is all that you can score. Pleather. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, oh, it's been a pleather. <laughs> My pleather. <laughs> uh, the, the word for this episode is pleather. <laughs> pleather. Pleather. <laughs> Number 39. Oh, Remember Me, I'd Rather Not, by Cliff Richard. Uh, well, the wind, the wind, the, God, the wind yeah. in this video, the wind. It's yeah. so windy. <laughs> yeah, there's so much wrong in this video. I just have noted that this it's got so much singing slightly into the air and fist pumping. Like your neck, <laughs> his neck is like angled at 80 degrees all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he's like looking upwards and punching he's like the worst boxer his dancing's um, actually a crime in some areas of Britain which if you walk down the street and start doing that dance they'll just come out and arrest you and then put you in a small well, like shed they had to, they had to design um, a road sign for it <laughs> no cliffs no, <laughs> no cliff cliffs, dancing yeah. <laughs> Do you notice yeah. it looks like he periodically it looks like he stepped on a drawing <laughs> pen he just kind of so little pain faces he goes little pain faces ah uh, uh, it's like he stepped on a drone pin. It's like, yeah. that's the secret. That's his secret. <laughs> so that's how he gets those high notes. It steps is. on a drawing pin. It's to- so terrible. Yeah, the, the constant wind machine in this is, you know, that's why there was no wind machine in uh, <laughs> Sam Fox's video, because he's nicked yes, it. he borrowed it. Yeah, it is. Borrowed, Where'd you get that yeah. wind machine from? I nicked it, and I do it <laughs> again. Do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, Richard. <laughs> he's outsmarted uh, us, everyone. I don't know how he did it, but he's outsmarted us. <laughs> <laughs> it's that constant looking up at 80 degrees. <laughs> oh, dear. In at number 42, it's Time Stand Still by Rush and Amy Mann. Yeah, it's good. It's a really good song, that. It is so, a very good song. Yeah, not good. I don't know what more to say about it. It's just one of the one of the good, really good Rush songs. I really like it, that one. It's from Hold Your Fire, which probably is coming out at some point, or as may, may, maybe we've already mentioned it. It's... Their 300th album. <laughs> it was, I think, what was it then? <laughs> it was their 12th studio, al- studio album. Wow. Because um, mm-hmm. it was the end of their third era. <laughs> God, the third epoch of the <laughs> yeah, men not, of Rel. I'm not kidding. <laughs> How many Rels is that? <laughs> so they, they did four albums alive, four albums live. Four albums, this was the 12th studio. There was a live album after this. Wow. Um, so this was the end of their um, quite heavy uh, synth phase, um, which okay. was the mid-80s phase where they were going through that. Yeah, there's loads of floating in this video. It's not a particularly great video. It's a really good song, though. And it's, got one of the, mm. it's one of the songs that I remember that got me into him yeah. because I really like the um, the lyrical content and and, yes. this, uh, and the message behind the song, which is all about, you know, tr- treasure the, the moments that happen because they'll soon be gone. And, you know, you, know, you want sometimes for time to stand still. And I like that. It's a different thing to what you're going to see from bloody MSG or whatever and White Snake and things like that. So it's kind of why kind of why i got into them but yeah it's, it is a good song a lot of people don't like this period of rush a lot of the sort of big okay. rush fans that they, they think it's they were watered down from their earlier you know proggy yeah. rocky elements but yeah good song you've got to move with the times and you've got to evolve man absolutely after 12 albums you gotta do something else aren't you yes yeah what you shouldn't do though is number 49 no i don't need no doctor uh, no. by wasp and that's what i mean by the difference in like Good, good rock and yeah, bad rock. I, I felt really dirty and unclean after watching that video on YouTube. It was horrible, wasn't it? That close-up yeah. shot right at the beginning where he puts the straps of cod piece on. No, oh, it's just oh, it's, no, he's, no. He's, uh, he's lacing up his lacing up his pants. It reminded me of a real weird, crappy episode of Blackadder. I need not go into the attributes of the codling grinder. <laughs> I also like, thought the, the guitars were all horrible as well. Yeah, horrible, hot, just horrible. Everything about it's horrible. Everything and it's but, a cover. It's not even their own song. Damn them! No. Damn them! Uh, number sixty-seven is "Hit the North" by The Fall. Um, yeah. I don't know what this is. I'm not a massive Fall fan. 
Never no, happened. English English post punk group formed in 1976 in Prestwich, Greater Manchester. I don't know anything else about them. Post punk when you were formed before punk. Don't ask difficult questions to answer. How many times have <laughs> I told you? Post punk, by the way, is a broad genre of rock music that emerged in the late 70s. Mm, interesting. As musicians departed from the raw simplicity and traditionalism of punk rock, instead adopting a variety of avant-garde sensibilities and non-rock influences. That sounds like utter gobbledygook to me that's probably yeah, written also, on the side of some justification for somewhere. For something. Yeah, also, also sounds like a, a description of crap. Oh, you could just shut it down and say, post-punk occurred after punk, hence the post part. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yep. I've just noted that it's a tuneless horror, which yep. is the story Lovecraft never wrote. <laughs> Get right in. <laughs> I'm gonna. So, as I write this, sweat on my brow. Uh, I, I must tell you the story of uh, Marky e. Smith <laughs> and the terrible tuneless horror, and and the things that befall them in the fall. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, number 75 is In the Clouds by All About Eve. All About Eve. Very commercial, yeah. wasn't it, this? In song. the Clouds, yeah. It's a, yeah. It's a catchy catchy old tune. Good track. I like that mm, one. Yeah, uh, more commercial than album, I've ever heard. The first album's solid. The first album Weirdly, is really solid. Weirdly, it's been banned from YouTube, that video. Has it? Yeah, it couldn't, it couldn't. YouTube, if you go to YouTube, it says no. So I had to go to Vimeo for that one. Oh, no, weird. And finally, number 80, Kiss by Total Contrast. Yeah, nondescript house track of the nondescript yeah. kind. Yeah, there's loads of these. I just pop them in every now and again. Probably, there's tons, probably some jacking going on in there or something. There's lo- there'll be loads of jacking. It's you know, what, what everyone jacking. was doing back then. Let's move into albums. 4th of October, number two, Strange Ways Here We Come by The Smiths. No. <laughs> That's the polite way, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not talking about Smiths anymore. I don't like it. No. no. Um, number 10, Music for the Masses by Depeche Mode. Uh, sixth studio album, this. I'd pretty much tuned out of Depeche Mode now by this point, really. I still really like their stuff prior to this, but this is the way it was starting to... I was drifting apart from them at this point. Yeah, I, I wasn't ever a huge fan, but I was kind of drifting out from them. I think Violator's next, in it? Yeah. I quite album. like some of the stuff like that, but just I found this this one's very nondescript, kind of in the middle. It's just not really good. It's Yeah, it's got some good tracks. Strange Love. Yeah. Um, beneath, yeah, yeah. Beneath Strange the, Love. Between, not Between the Wheels, whatever it is. Yeah, it's yeah, good yeah. tracks in it, but it's not overall, it's not as good as um, some great reward and stuff. Number 17, Big Generator by Yes. Ah, uh, Yes. Yeah, their 12th studio album. Um, did you actually like Yes? Just because if you like Rush, I thought maybe Yes would have been also on your radar. Perhaps some no, not, no, no, not nothing. no. Um, so this started out being produced by Trevor Horn. Imagine what it would have sounded like if that had happened. Wow. But it was a laborious album to make, apparently. Um, recording began in Caramate in Italy. That's how you pronounce that. But eternal, internal and creative differences resulted in production to resume in London, where Trevor Horn ended his time with the band due to continuing problems. The album was completed in Los Angeles, 1997, by Trevor Rabin and produced and producer Paul de Villiers. Um, and it sounds more like a no to me. It does sound hey. like more like a no. Hey, <laughs> hey, it's here all week. Ba, 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 ba. Um, <laughs> yeah, they would only allow producers with the name Trevor, I noted. <laughs> Trevor Horn, Trevor Rabin. Um <laughs> But I don't know who Paul De Villiers is. <laughs> We've got the uh, the No Trevors and the Trevors gang. <laughs> but can Sorry, I your it? name's not Trevor, is it? <laughs> 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 um, t- well, talking about producers. Um, oh, yeah, epic. N- number 29, Islands by Mike Oldfield, his 11th studio album. God, it's loads, isn't it? Rush with 12th, Yes with 12th. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this has 11th. been the theme of the last couple of episodes with the music. There have been loads of lots of 12ths, 13ths, lots of double figure album releases. Studio yeah. albums, quite mad, really. So, this produced this album boasts the largest number of co producers out of all of Oldfield's work. It was handled by Michael Cretu, uh, later of Enigma fame. That That's, explains a great know, deal. It explains a lot. And uh, you, that word fame is doing a lot of... Uh, yeah. <laughs> in yeah. There. Jeffrey Downs, uh, Tom Newman, not not to be so, uh, confused with Tom Noonan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you see? <laughs> Mike Oldfield, you owe me ore. <laughs> Iron ore. <laughs> <laughs> Stroke the tiger. Mike, stroke it. <laughs> stroke um, the tiger. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm a musician, damn it. Ne- I said stroke ne- the tiger. That's my next album title. <laughs> to me, you're an ant in the afterbirth. <laughs> I'm not putting that in any of my songs. <laughs> that's my next album title. <laughs> uh, Simon Phillips, Alan Shacklock. Uh, uh, don't and mess with the Shacklock. The Shacklock cometh. <laughs> Shacklock cometh, and he will make the noise that make your hair turn grey and your ears hey, turn inside out. In, in your ears turn inside out. <laughs> with claws that slip and teeth that bite, the Shacklock will approach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Mike Oldfield himself. Uh, yes, of course. Yes. 
Um, singers on the album, we've got Bonnie Tyler, Kevin Ayers, Anita Hegeland, Max Bacon, and Jim Price. Islands was also released a full-length VHS video album, because for each track a video was made and released, often mixing state-of-the-art uh, for the time, yeah. computer-generated images with real-life images. Is Max Bacon, is he related to full sausage, <laughs> stuffed pork, and crammed ham? Yeah, but they, they were the various the musicians on the album, they're just not credited. <laughs> Who played o- bass on that one? Meat-based <laughs> produ- production team, please. <laughs> <laughs> what for this whole t- whole album? You only people who have got names like meat. Do you realise how difficult that is outside of meatloaf? He's got them all. <laughs> Full sausage, stuffed pork, crammed ham. <laughs> Where's pot pie? Get him in here. It's brilliant on the base. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> Get it on <laughs> it. You said you said you was. Oh, for God's sake! Oh well, <laughs> chicken ticker it is. You never trust a pork pie. They all it's a rhyming <laughs> slam for a, you know for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> He tells another pork pie he has. Crammed uh, ham. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, crammed uh, ham. Max, Max bacon. bacon. Crammed ham. Max bacon. That's, that's just that's how he likes his bacon. Maxed. <laughs> how much how do you much want? Bacon? <laughs> Max. All the <laughs> Cover the plate with bacon. <laughs> Ma- I want Max bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Maximum bacon now. <laughs> that's it. That's how he. Uh, that's how he launches his superpower. <laughs> <laughs> Max <Stop>. bacon. <laughs> Aye, Max bacon. <laughs> Goodness me, he's covered in bacon. <laughs> his fingers. <laughs> he can fire bacon from his nose. <laughs> his fingers are rashers. <laughs> <laughs> Max Bacon. Oh, Never Jesus. go to a bloody greasy spoon with him. Max Bacon. Oh, no. Deirdre, Deirdre. He's come in again. Oh, he cleared us out of bacon last time. I know, but he pays. He's a pain customer. Come on, get on with the bacon. All of it. All of it. All of it. All of it. I've got six packs. That's nowhere near enough for him. Don't he, make him say- Mac, he, said, he said Max, you heard him. Max Bacon. That's half bacon. Don't make him say the words so or we've got to cover him in it. Because he thinks he's some kind of stupid superhero with yeah. bacon-based powers, you know what whatever like. they he's would got, be. He's got bacon shoes on, for God's sake. The guy loves his bacon. <laughs> God. Absolutely. He watches uh, Footloose over and over and over again. <laughs> Favourite Kevin film. Ba- Kevin Bacon's brother is Max Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good old Max Bacon. <laughs> oh dear anyway where was that anyway <laughs> and now I've got to go to a picture of James Brown <laughs> no wonder he's looking like that <laughs> the best of James Brown by James Brown <laughs> ow <laughs> ha <laughs> yeah give me it <laughs> is anyone here <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Who's going to get, cook me some bacon? Who's going to cook me some bacon? Ah. Cook me some bacon. Come here now. Max, don't you kick it off. <laughs> get up, uh, get on bacon. Uh, get up, uh, give me bacon. Uh, not all of it. No, it's, uh, he's very sweaty I in that video. Bacon. He's actually sweat so much in that picture that he's actually, he's, that's, not a, he's, that's not a shirt he's wearing. That's just his body's formed a shirt from the sweat. <laughs> <laughs> it's his defense. It's his defense mechanism. <laughs> when he gets terrified, he sweats so much. He's, he creates an exoskeleton. It <laughs> really forms pleather, <laughs> filled with bacon. <laughs> James Brown's pleather. <laughs> what are your plates made of? Pleather. <laughs> Give me a what pleather. About these of... and forks. Pleather. pleather. How's that pleather They're really bacon. floppy? <laughs> <laughs> How am I supposed to eat it? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> just, just cram it in. Get up. Oh. Give me your bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Number 51. <laughs> Reflections by Foster and Allen. Yes, yeah, good old Foster and Allen. Uh, 54 of the same songs they always sing, just in a different order. Yeah, and on CD. 54 <laughs> timeless memories. I know. I did actually have to, I did look at the track listening for that. I was going to put it there. And then it was just, you, I just, you could make them, if you said 10 songs you think they would have sung, they'll be the ones they sang. Yeah. Things like Green, Green Grass at Home and Old Danny Boy and you just, Which you know, all that kind of stuff. Ironic by this point, because neither of them can remember anything. No. And I noticed he's got an accordion in there, look. He um, has, yeah. So he's, you know, he's gone full Andy Bell. He has. I wonder if he yeah, dances he like him. I reckon um, he probably does. Number 55, In No Sense Nonsense by The Art of Noise. Yes, third album. So by the time of the recording, the group had been reduced to a duo with the engineer Gary Langdon leaving the previous year. Langdon's mix engineering work was taken over by Bob Krushar. 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 <laughs> Bob Krushar. Krushar. <laughs> <laughs> Why have and you brought Ted- a Klingon in to produce this <laughs> album? <laughs> Choi Chu, <laughs> and uh, which is embarrassing that I even know some Klingon. And um, Ted Hayden for the album. But the music was produced entirely by Anne Ann Dudley and JJ Jacklick. 
<laughs> I brought another one in. <laughs> Jack, okay. What is it with the late eighties? So many people just moving around, just doing stuff. Well, you know, it was that. It was that. Very you know, something out, in the water. The Klingons are doing well out of it, though. They are number seventy-eight, halfway to sanity by the Ramones. The 10th yeah. studio album. Yep. And the last okay. one to feature Richie Ramone on the drums as he left because he felt he wasn't being paid enough. Oh, okay. <laughs> Amongst other reasons. He came back later. Okay. Um, Is that when he couldn't he... find a job that paid as much? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Realised actually the not, drum, drum in the band. Pl- I didn't get paid as much as I was stacking shelves in Tesco's. <laughs> it turns out I was being paid enough. <laughs> Can I come back? Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 11th of October, number one, Tunnel of Love by Brinks. Bruce Springsteen, straight in. <laughs> bring, bring Sprucestein. Br- bring Sprucestein. <laughs> God. <laughs> I've just got bacon on my mind. Bacon and pleather. Pleather bacon. bacon. <laughs> Is that like Heather Bacon? <laughs> pleather bacon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. It's Ma- Max and Kevin's sister. Oh, dear. Pleather bacon. Um, yeah, no, no, no. Bruce no. Springsteen, no, no. No. Number four, Red by the Communards. Do you know, it's the second album of theirs, and I don't think I've heard an album's with the material from them ever. Would you ever? Would you want to? I don't, I, I don't mind the songs I've heard from the Communards or from Bronsky B or whichever variation it was. But but at this point in life, I think if you'd have wanted to hear an album's with the material from the yeah, Communards, true. I reckon you would have done. True. And his song, his, his pitch gets higher and higher and higher, and he's heading dangerously into Shadmok territory for me. <laughs> oh, shaklak. No, <laughs> shaklak. Shaklak territory. Shadmok, Shaklak. Yeah, they'll come attacking and the Klingons will shaklak. be in. Shaklak, yeah. It's all gone wrong. Shaklak, shak, uh, shaklak, shaklak, shaklak. Yeah, it's all that can happen. Uh, number 62, Sonic Flower Groove by Primal Screen. Yeah. So, yeah. Debut solo, debut studio album. Um, it's all right. It's just, they'll, they'll go on to much bigger things. Number 74, The Right Night and Barry White. <laughs> self-produced 16th album from mr white ah oh, yeah. yeah he produces what he produces and he produces what he wants and it's all self-produced that's the problem exactly that's the problem yeah mm. it goes it just goes in the studio and comes out and he's produced <laughs> it's like he's like guy, cre- that guy could smooth talk a microphone into submission he's crazy <laughs> like the creaming <laughs> You've been you've been Barry Whited. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. It's a towel. <laughs> Ew. Not that towel. It's pleather. Because <laughs> it is. I have this one. Don't use that one. It's bacon. <laughs> That's my bacon towel. Get off. <laughs> when I'm hungry in the shower, I like to nibble. <laughs> on nibble my bacon my, towel. On, on my old shower bacon. <laughs> Good bit of the old I don't shower use bacon. Shower gel. <laughs> I work oh, with bacon. Uh, 18th of October, Nothing Like the Sun by Sting. Yeah, we yeah. spoke about that, didn't we? Yeah, As you really. noted, yeah, pick a genre and stick with it. Uh, number seven, Alphabet City by ABC. Fourth studio album, still only know one song of theirs. Which is? Look of love, I get the look of oh, yeah. love. Yeah, yeah. love. <laughs> that one. Oh, yeah, that one. Um, yep. Number 20, Simply Shadows <laughs> by The Shadows. <laughs> um, that description? <laughs> More Fender guitar covers of popular music from those mini walk afflicted crazies, Shadows. <laughs> yeah. The track listing's hilarious for this. I knew you were waiting yeah. for me. We don't need another hero. <laughs> 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 we we oh. didn't lose some of its kind of <laughs> power if performed through the magic of Fender. Yeah, the answer um, you're looking for is yes. And then later down the line, you've got things like Walking in the Air. I guess that's why they call it the Blues, A Lady in Red. And then if you go further down, you've got the themes from EastEnders and Howard's <laughs> Way. Do, and how, do, do. How desperate do you have to be? You go from the music of the night from the Phantom of the Opera to EastEnders theme. Yeah. What were they thinking? What, at what point did they go, well, can we put next on the album? Uh, how about EastEnders? Yeah, we haven't done that before. Have we? Right, up we go. <laughs> do, 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 do. <gasps> Just These last four, are they on it as well? I want to know what love is. Or is that you? Yeah. No, they're, oh, they're all on it, yeah. Jealous. Chain reaction. I mean, are we talking the Donna Summer Bee yeah. Gees? Chain they're, reaction. They're in the middle of the chain. Down, down, yeah, so down, 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 down. I think if you actually take the first letter of each of those, it spells out some kind of command. Like, Please help me. <laughs> help, I'm help me. Hank won't let me go. <laughs> I'm, I'm trapped in the shadows and have been for some time. <laughs> he keeps me in his basement. Um, <laughs> the room was full of Hank Marvin pictures. <laughs> some of them were very, very old. old. <laughs> uh, scribbler. As I've noted, who the hell is buying this to get it to number 20? I don't know. I don't know. Shadow people. Y- yeah. The shacklocks. <laughs> shacklocks and the bacon. Uh <laughs> Number 47 is George Best by The Wedding Present. Dave, you album. 
apparently. Mm. I don't know if there are a lot of footballers' names used for albums. Did wonder if you're Peter Beardsley by the Four Tops, <laughs> Jimmy Greaves by the Smiths, and Jan Molby by the Grateful Dead. <laughs> Did you see the cover for the album as well? It's just a picture of George Best. Of course. Well, what else would you do? I don't know. George Best. George, not his best. I'd love to uh, hear the Grateful Dead singing about 1980s Liverpool midfielder Jan Mulby. (laughs) (laughs) He's Danish as well. So, you know, that's a a whole new layer to it. I think he was 80s. Oh, 80s, early 90s. There we go. Um, number 65 is Perfect Timing by MSG. Ugh. Ugh, They're back again. Yes. Dangerous. Dangerous. Too much of that. It's too salty. It is. Yeah, number 69, bad news, bad news. Funny in the programme, not in this kind of thing, no. I think. No, joke stretch too far. Number 81, House of Dolls by Gene Loves Jezebel. British rock band formed in the 80s. Identical twin brothers, Jay and Michael Aston. As a result of a rift between the Aston brothers in 1997 and ongoing legal issues, they're currently two incarnations of the band. <laughs> and as I've noted, two <laughs> yep. too many. <laughs> yep, too too many. Bad time. But just weird, I mean, what's the, what are they called? Gene Loves Jezebel and Jezebel Doesn't Love Gene. Don't know. I don't know. Jean Jean likes Jezebel. Yeah, yeah. Jean has a bit of a Jean, thing. Jeannie and Jezza. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. Twenty uh, fifth of October. Let's get these in done with. In at number two was the Christians by the Christians. Yeah, bland. Bland indeed. Uh, in at number thirty, there's been loads of these. I just picked one out because CD re release that is. I think. Yeah, Abbey Road 1987 version with the Beatles. Yeah. yeah, they got real release on CD. Didn't they? I remember that being a big deal? Yeah. Um, number fifty eight, just visiting this planet by Jella Bean. Uh, good old uh, John Benitez, famous for producing Into the Groove, of course, by Madonna and several of her stuff. Yeah, we well, did that, the big mix album, didn't you? Yeah, that, that, yeah, it's, yeah. It's a good, he's a really good producer. It's yeah. a really good album. Right? Yes, it is. Not, I don't know about Just Visiting the Planet, never heard it. Uh, number 62, Glenn Jones by Glenn Jones. Yeah, he's an American soul and R&B singer that I have literally no knowledge of. No, just to round off, nearly. Number 66, Let's Boogie by Shaking Stevens. Good old Michael Barrett. He was yeah. born in 1948. Did you know that? So he's probably pretty shaky anyway nowadays. <laughs> Very shaky. Um, the album is split into a studio side and a live side. Of the five studio tracks, four were released as singles, all becoming top 40 hits in the UK. He was always popular for some reason, wasn't he? And, and mm. just as, I don't know if you know this, but every year in Eli in Cardiff, which is where Shaken Stevens and his 10 siblings lived, that's rocking, rolling, bumping, falling, Leaning, grinning, dancing, pumping, and clapping. Shit, Stevens. Um, <laughs> pumping there's <a> special, Stevens. <laughs> there's a special event known as the shaking, or Please. I'm not even trying to pronounce it in Welsh. Yeah, but it's, it's pronounced yours, yours, in Welsh. It's, I can't speak Welsh. On the first day of the second month of the, at 3 p.m., the local minister of tragedy will walk <laughs> to the green door of Shaking Stevens' house and knock four times with a large bronze ladle known as the knocker clap or clap knocker. After that, the minister emits the shrek sonog or wiridig or sonic shriek of truth and draws a keylog, Ophelli, a cock and balls on the door with coloured chalk, where he claps three more times and honks until a local Julie appears, who he then whistles in the ear of until she runs out of breath. Um, it's good that local customs are maintained, I think, in Wales. It's very good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hopefully I'll never get invited to that. No. Um, no, no. Because I'm not quite sure I want any part of uh, that. And I might bump into rocking, rolling, leaning. <laughs> All of those, yeah. Just clapping, gr- grinning. Gr- grinning's really scary. <laughs> Grinning Stevens. Grinning Stevens. He never talks. Why is he smiling? That's all he does. He can't not. He can't not. Uh, number 69 is Dirty Dancing, the original soundtrack. Yeah, the film, yeah. it coming. We'll see it at some point. Uh, and finally, number 93 is Free as a Bird from Supertramp. All right. Ninth the album. Ninth, yeah, the ninth. Not quite hit 10 yet. No, it's odd bit of a turn of direction for super tramp at the time because it's a lot more synthy that one mm. so it's got the more dance beats and rhythms so it, it doesn't sound a lot like the super tramp that you would might remember from things like give a little bit or that kind of yeah thing. logical song and stuff logical and, song and all that yeah yeah there we go that's all your music bacon is all i can really say bacon and pleather <laughs> bacon, bacon and, pleather. and pleather um go, go out and buy yourself some bacon and pleather <laughs> and then wrap it in pleather <laughs> that'd be awful yeah well there we go and and be, beware of the shack clock <laughs> for he comes for he cometh <laughs> he cometh <laughs> shack lock oh dear oh yeah there you go that's the music we'll be back in a bit um where we have is it six more games we want to get through six more games yeah yeah six more games of high quality to get through <laughs> high quality graham high yeah. high quality so please uh keep on listening and we'll be back in a bit Sun, C and Chippy T to our sponsor, DavidHernWriter.com. Let's take another listen to his amazing new book, Escape from the Commodore 64. Looky here. 
a crimson-cheeked man in torn overalls stepped forward. The gulch ain't no place for young ladies. Amidst the commotion, another man emerged from the saloon, causing others to scurry. He made his way down the steps, knees bent in a way that suggested pain was part of his daily life. You the sheriff of this stinking town? He bellowed. Sarah looked at Nell. Nell looked at Sarah, and together, they turned their attention back to the bearded character, complete with ten-gallon hat, dangling cigar, and spurs jittering against the ground. Without thinking, Sarah placed her hand across her holster. What's it to you, punk? She asked, surprising even herself. The bearded man pulled up, shocked at the response. How dare a woman speak to him in that manner? You lawmen are all cowards. Ladies, Nell corrected him, and we don't like your looks. Get out of town. As the mayor of Targ, I declare this book awesome. Escape from the Commodore 64 audiobook is out right now. Visit davidhernwriter.com today. What are you waiting for? And once again, we are back. I um, hope you enjoyed all that. Um, we've got, as I said, six games to go through, so let's get straight into these. Um, and Graham, let's tell us all about Ace 2. Ace 2 uh, is the sequel to Ace, obviously, uh, mm-hmm. which was a game I think we liked when we reviewed it before. Yeah, we thought it was um, okay, yes. Yeah, yeah, it was okay of this type. So it's is coded by Ian Martin, who coded the original Ace, but also did Skyrunner and later did Star Wars. Um, graphics are by Damon Redmond, who did 19, Traz, and Ace 2088. Probably has something to do with Ace as well, I suspect, somewhere on the line, maybe. Design of this game is, of course, Ian Martin. Music here, Rob Hubbard, interestingly. So, Ace Combat uh, Emulator 2. Ace 2 is a head-to-head fight and uh, flight and combat simulation for one or two players, each flying a different type of fighter plane. Playing one is a carrier-based aircraft, while playing two is, a, is stationed at an airbase. In the single-player mode, the human controls player one, and the computer flies plane two using very advanced artificial intelligence. This is from the instructions um, to execute both mm-hmm. offensive and defensive maneuvers. Offensive maneuvers in the dark is an album, isn't it? A group. Um, <laughs> plane two is from a, a desert country with a western coastline. Plane one is based on a foreign aircraft carrier, which is positioned out of territorial waters. So it's kind of two games, really. This. You have a close-range dogfight game, and you have the full-scale aerial and ground attack. And you can choose these kind of games, modes of play. In the close-range dogfight, both aircraft are with aerial cannons, and with close-range heat-seeking missiles, they are placed at a random map positions, but fairly close to each other. The planes must fight each other, dogfight style using the available weapons, and if one aircraft is shot down, the game continues, both pilots receiving a fresh plane. The game ends when one of the pilots has to has no more aircraft left, so it's just a shootout, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Second one is a full-scale aerial and ground attack. They... Country of Plane 1 has positioned a, sca- a spy ship close to the coast of the rival, whose mission is to monitor an inshore radar station. Contrary to all the expectations, the inhabitants have reacted aggressively to this action and have sent a single plane from an airbase to the east of the radar station to destroy enemy any aircraft and sink the enemy vessel. Help is summoned and a single carrier-based fighter is sent with orders to shoot down the attacker and then destroy the aforementioned radar station. Each aircraft has an aerial cannon and can be further armed with a variety of short and long-range air mis- air-to-air missiles and air-to-ground missiles. The pilot must choose the weapon load, the section in the section where you arm your audience and load your plane with the audience, which is quite a nice touch. And then obviously you then attempt the said missions. So it's quite an interesting game, this. You've got quite a little bit to sort of different scenario. So when you get the first menu, you can sort of commence your conflict. You can obviously choose your combatants. Um, you've got, uh, you can change your skill levels if you want. And I think it was numbered one to 20 for the skills when you get to that part. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think one is e- obviously easy. 20 is n- never going to survive, which you won't, you won't. Obviously, then you can change the combat scenarios, which I've just described, and how many planes you have. So you've got, you can set the parameters of this game quite well, whether the crash detection's there, number of missiles required to kill and hit, and then obviously if it's disc, um, which this version that we played must have been the tape version because there's an menu, the save to disc menu option was missing. So I'm guessing it's a cracked tape version of some kind. Probably. Um, so you then split, go to the kind of split screen view when you fight. So you load up your ordnance and then you go to the sort of split screen view and you've got a kind of a similar view to Ace, isn't it? I think it's safe to say. Yeah, it's yeah. a bit more, it's a bit more greatest, but it's basically the same kind of view. So two are playing yeah. side, side by side, play one on one screen, play two on the other. You've both got independent keyboard controls as well. So um, I didn't know all of them down, but I was player one in joystick port one. So I had F, S, X, E and Q. So increased engine was F faster i guess s was mm. decrease engine slower x was the map view e select your weapons the controls have been kept deliberately simple i think mm-hmm. um in order for that you could you don't have to sort of sit there it's not this is not uh, in any real stretch of the imagination a simulation of sorts even though it is called ace it's it's more it is more of a sort of arcade style shooter and 
And so it plays out quite nicely. It's very nicely produced, this game. Graphics are good in it. It's very Top Gun influenced, if you ask me, in the sense that of the way it's played out, the kind of feel of the game and the music especially. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's very, very fast. It's very speedy. The options and the graphics and the displays are all good. Um, you get a really nice sort of view of your sort of sit rep. So you get your view of the classic view that you get with your uh, target reticule in the center. You can choose your weapons quite quick. You can fly and as you navigate, the horizon's moving really fast. So it's even two play, it's a really fast game. So you do get a sense of sort of frantic action in it a bit. And the displays that you get that controls the altimeter and the, that information, the ba- you get the basic information. You're not overwhelmed with it, but you get enough to be able to fly this plane. And, and, it, some, and it starts you in the air, which is kind of cool. You'd have to take off and do the stupid stuff. This is something that you said before. Why don't you start in the air? Well, you do here, and that's quite good. And so, so it feels like it's less about flying the plane and more about fighting with the plane and shooting and, and that kind of stuff. And in two players, I imagine this is probably a really good blast between two. I think we even we might have played this back in the day at some point and had a bit of blast with it. I don't remember being having lots of lasting fun, certainly not in the single-player camp, because when I played it single-player this time around, I found that it was actually quite hard. I was just getting targeted and shot down very quickly, even in the easy yeah. modes. And I might be just, I'm crap at these kind of games, no, but I just didn't not. seem to be able to get a, <laughs> get a any kind of position on my opposing aircraft to really shoot any. I don't think I could ever have him in the screen on the, for more than 36 microseconds before he flew off, which is part of the problem of the game. I'll come to that just in a second. So I liked what they were trying to do here. Let's get away from the dull, veteran-infused, boring nonsense of some of these flight simulators that we've had. And let's try and get down to what these games' hearts are, which is sh- trying to aim, you know, shoot and fast-paced shooting and, and frantic. The problem is that it's it's moving around at such a chunky, fast pace. It's really hard to target anything. Everything's a bit nondescript. So you, you're flying, chasing kind of a, what looks like a little kind of flashing dot in your main window for quite some time. And it, it never really changes that much. You can target that dot and you can fire things at the dot and shoot at it. But before you know, your alarm's going off and you're being shot at and boom, you're out of the sky. Mm-hmm. And it just feels like there's a lot of, fast moving green and blue in this but it's still got that stupid green and blue logic to it it still feels like at underneath all of the simplicity exchange that's gone on to make this game approachable and fast and all those things it's still just green at the bottom blue at the top and just dots moving around at speed and i don't know it's a better version of that and i did have some fun replaying it because it didn't rely on lots of advanced technical knowledge and a 50 page manual to get me to raise the flaps and do all the stupid stuff that you tend to have to do in these games. And I had some fun with it, but it was very, very, very short-lived in terms of the one player and two player, I imagine, if you've got two people, you might never find each other, but you would at least probably have a better dogfight because you would both be trying to... It would just be, I think it would just work better. I think we played a game last episode that was probably better two player, which was the uh, cleanup one, wasn't it? What was it called? Cleanup service. Cleanup service. Which was, which was a which was rubbish in one player because it was just overwhelmingly difficult. But two player probably had a lot of merit. And I think this is another case of that. I think there's yeah. they obviously tested this heavily with two players players playing it, and the th- and one player. Well, that's a bit of an effort, but you're probably going to spend more time one player than you do two. Maybe these generally aren't my cup of tea. These games, and it is still I can't get out of that naff kind of experience of flying but it's at least this is better at tr- what it's trying to do and it is fast and the music's ace for this i really love the music phrase too by robber but it really does capture that kind of top gunny dog fighty vibe i quite like it but um it's just perhaps not quite my cup of tea overall but it isn't saying that it isn't pretty good for what it is because it is 81 percent, probably about right 10 quid yeah it's, it's not bad for two-player action not bad at all about you i think yeah i think in two-player it may be different but i, I don't know i, I I'm not. I, I I like. It's impressive that they've gone for something different than not just read on Ace, but I kind of just wanted more Ace, but better. I I don't really get on with these two player fight fight sims. So we've played a few of them. Um, because as you noted, in one play, it's just impossible to do anything. Even on level one, which I figured was the easiest, you just instantly tags it and they're honing on you, the missile you, and you you're done before you can even get a bead on them, and you're dead before you know it. Which I found, you know, it happens constantly and it gets frustrating very quickly. I didn't think the graphics were as good as the first game. It's not so much green and blue, by the way. It's blue and blue and yellow and blue. Yes, yeah. It's just it's just very base colours and, not, it's and all just chunks of colour moving around, isn't it? Yeah, and, yeah. and trying to actually get the enemy plane into interview, it's just like a white triangle that kind of moves about. It's... Mm. I suppose I didn't think the graphics were as good as the first game, but it's probably because of the consequence of the split screen. And I suppose, you know, technically it's clever, as most of these are, because it does move at a clip and, you know, whatever. But I think it, when it came down to it, I just wanted an evolution of Ace yeah, um, with yeah. technical upgrades and the like. I thought Ace was really clever with its, you know, mid air refueling, different yeah, things. It's not to all do. that, it's all gone. Yeah, it's just it's just ripped out. And this is just, it's like the antithesis. This is literally the antithesis of what I wanted in an Ace sequel. 
I don't know. So, you know, I've been a bit cruel and said I asked to, but it's not. I mean, that's a bit, and I think that's been a bit punitive, a bit mean, and it's not really that, but it's just not for me. And I think mm-hmm. I just wanted, like, take Ace, look at what you could have sort of honed up a bit and toned up a bit and made a bit better. And technically, you've got obviously got better at it and things and just make more of that. But I don't know why they've gone for this two player forced mode. It feels. Like, like not what I wanted. And maybe other people did. And maybe we did play this. I don't really know. I don't really remember much of this one. I remember Ace, but not Ace 2. So for me, this was a this was a misfire. This was a, you know, your missiles locked underneath your thingy and it ain't getting go. Um, mm-hmm. So for me, I, I didn't I didn't like this, which was, yeah, they gave Age 1 Senate. And I presume in an office with other people and you're playing it two player. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I can see why that would work because you're all, you're fighting against the same thing and you're both clamoring at the keyboard, pressing the keys that you yeah, got to yeah, hit and yeah. stuff like that. And I imagine in that kind of situation, this would be some fun but might work like, like we said last last week if you if you're playing cleanup service on your own it's not fun and this on no, your it's own not. it's just no. It's no fun shame no nope. there you go that's uh ace two no let's move along to what, what it is though it's better than the next one yes <laughs> uh, And our next one is uh, a budget title. So this is the proper budget. Mm-hmm. This is Death Race. What the hell do you say about this? So this was originally released on the VIC-20 back in 1984, then for the C-16 Plus 4 in 1985. And then someone had the brain fart to port this to both the C-64 and the Atari 8-bit machines in 87, by the looks of it, and put it out a budget title. I think that's what's happened. I cannot for the life of me think they would why they would do that. So what is Death Race? It's not based on the film, which would have been something if it was, because there's obviously the 70s, you know, gory spectacle with Sylvester Stallone and what have you. This is basically a crap, less impressive version of the 1981 Sega arcade game, um, Turbo. So um, yeah. Turbo was like one of the old, oldest, you know, it's one of the oldest pseudo 3D racing games. Um, it was quite innovative at the time when Turbo came out. Um, it was quite impressive at the time with the, you know, warping scenery and curves and bends. And you're basically just driving as fast as you can to get, you know, checkpoint through places. It's, you know, it's, it's basic design because, you know, it's six years old at this point. So, but in this, in, in Death Race, whereas Turbo went through cities and went through turns and all that kind of thing, they don't none of that in this. You simply have to drive along a straight road that never turns or bends. And you have to, and you have to overtake 70 cars in an 80 second time limit. That's it. That is it. There's nothing else to this. Um, if you get hit, your car explodes. If you die three times, it's game over. You push forward to accelerate and hit fire to change gear. The speed at which you can move across the track is also tied to how fast you are going. And that's not how things work. Um, no, you know, I can turn sharper at probably lower speeds. And, and, and so this is kind of weird. So you've got to be going really fast to be able to move across the road quick enough to avoid cars coming at you. But then because you're going so fast, time you have to react to them. And obviously you've got to go so fast because you've got to get past 70 cars in 80 seconds. It's that kind of logic here. The visuals are really super basic. The cars are crappily drawn nothing really works the 3d effect is poor there's tunnels at some point but they're really a lot worse than what we saw in things like electroglide and things like that considering we've got things like pit stop 2 super cycle and a whole host of other races out by now and even at budget range speed king's out so and you've got things you know if you want something different but still vehicle based kickstart 2 is out this is a joke it's a joke of a release i don't get it why would anyone think porting a three-year-old vic 20 game when it in itself was a version of a 1981 arcade game, it was a good idea. It's just a baffling release, this. I don't get it. You know, it's got nothing on the cover to make you want to play it. There's a picture of a skull with a, a, a laurel around it, you know, Death Race. Uh, but it's not. It's just Turbo and a crap version of it. So, um, no, this was very poor. 40%, God knows. I think this is another one they didn't play because there's no way you would give this 40%. Not Cat and L's chance. Did you enjoy Death Race? No. No, I did not. A crappy straight road racing game that is dull and about a billion years out of time. There's yeah. nothing redeeming here. Bad graphics, bad design, boring straight roads, ridiculous collisions. It's just really bad together. It's utterly, utterly terrible. Go and get Kickstart 2. So that's it. Yeah, that's it's it. Rubbish. it. Not, well, it's just ter- it's terrible. So no, 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 no. Yeah, no. Let's move on. Quickly, unlike Death Race ever did. Into our next budget one. Graham, Star Force Nova. Jeez. Goodness sake. This is coded <laughs> by Chris Harvey, musicians Matt Cooksey. Did you know the music in this was weird? It was like a really odd, off-key version of "I Feel Love" by Donna Summer. Yeah, 
I noticed um, that as well as I was playing it. Yeah, like, which, it, which it kind of is, and I'll come to a little comment from from Mr. Harvey himself about that. Mm, okay. Um, so the survivors of an alien attack are being evacuated on board a giant space arc. What is it with all these arcs that we've come across <laughs> recently? It's just everything's giant arcs. Arcs are invading arcs. Arcs, space arcs. You need to travel through the F dimension. I think you know, figure out with this game what that stands for. Um, to do this... <laughs> In order to escape. So you've got to try for the affirmation to do that. And that's where the aliens attacks are happening and they are intent on stopping you. So it's it's a kind of Iridium style side scrolling attempt. So you fly across the arc, shooting baddies, repeat. It's got base yep. relief graphics ish, an oddly small spaceship, <laughs> and basically yeah. not much else. There's an interesting comment on Lemon 64 from Chris Harvey himself. He writes, I was the programmer on this, and yes, it was rubbish. I actually did. It as, I, I actually did it as a favor for Ray Trudeau, the program of the C sixteen version, and a good mate of mine, Mark Cooksey, also a good mate of mine. Since we hired him to do the Airwolf music, it took me about two weeks to bang this out because Mastertronic only wanted the C sixteen version if there was a C sixty four version coming, C sixty four version coming. And there's a couple of fun facts. It was actually I feel loved by Donna Summer, and apparently a note for note copy of the twelve inch remix. I'm not so sure about that. My final response was just go and buy Kickstart two. Told you like loads of times now. <laughs> about you it's not much more to add is there <laughs> another left to right scroller enters the fray at the budget range and this is one annoying game that is fairly hard to understand really what to do the scrolling is constant you only have one life so death can be pretty quick and sudden it looks like iridium in that top down left to right bass relief kind of look type thing but there's obviously less care and attention and as you have just rightly pointed out two weeks it shows really it's all strange and there's like you said a really weird version of i feel love by donna summer playing throughout so nothing really fits together why is i feel love playing over this it's kind of strange and i don't understand it It, none of it makes any sense and i found myself reaching um for the off switch pretty quickly so star force nova star force no more like (laughs) <laughs> um, I don't yes. get how these are getting fifty two percent. I don't understand. Even they, at haven't, budget they, price. Cannot, they haven't played them. I don't doubt it. Now I've come to that conclusion. I don't. Um, think we're going to see it again. There's no way they're, they're all getting very average, middle of the road. We didn't play it reviews. And yeah, absolutely. Scores. We will see it again. Yeah, but yeah, none of these are very good. No, they should, should poor. be getting anywhere near that. Yeah, they're poor. You know, give it the kick and it deserves. Yeah, yeah. So even at two quid, rip off. I mean, when the actual creator of it says it's crap. Yep. <laughs> then it's crap. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with him. Let's move speedily along, though, into a game that is speedy. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. So our next one, oh, we're wrapping through these, aren't we? Evening Star, £8.95, and got the two-thirds award, 67%, because mm. we don't know really what to give it. So in 1962, I'll give you a bit of a history lesson here. So in 1962, the Evening Star was one of the most powerful steam locomotives of the British of Re- the British Railway's fleet. It hauled the Pine Express from Bath to Bournemouth and it, for the very last time in 1962, as it was then diverted via Reading and Basingstoke. There you go. If that nugget of information has got you all a froth in the steam plate <laughs> and wanting to toot your whistle, then Evening Star, with its recreation of that journey, may just be for you. If it hasn't, then please alight at the next stop and take all your belongings with you, which is what I advise you do. Uh, so this is the follow-up, although you might be mistaken to thinking it's the same game, uh, to the Southern Bell, um, something we looked at all the way back in episode 29 uh, July 1986. And you may remember we were not that enamoured with it. And no, I'm we sure weren't. it's going to come to no shock to you that I'm in no way enamoured with this sequel either. The line that this journey is recreating was closed in 1966 and, according to the box, was the end of a picturesque and much-loved railway with a long and glorious past. Take the role of both fireman and driver and join with us for a truly authentic journey into steam history. Now, I'm not knocking the ambition here, but when you use terms like picturesque and authentic and then present a game that, like its prequel, runs at barely one frame a second and is nothing more than a white screen with black vector graphics, I can't help but feel you're stretching those words to breaking point. Yep. There's nothing picturesque in this. Um, as I've already got the lauded 67%, which is damning with faint praise, because there is ambition here. Okay, I'll give it that. There's ambition. It's just not going to work on a one megahertz computer that always struggles with vector graphics. You can't claim to be an authentic journey through the English countryside when there's nothing but barren white space either side of the track. I'm not going to say much more. It is literally, you know, go back and listen to the Southern Bell review because it's it's more of that, just supposedly with a different line. Essentially, there's just different 
square vectors by the side mm. of the track as you trundle along it because everything else is exactly the same from the menu screen with its demo mode and up to full run and blah 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 and the way you do everything all it's every, it's the same they've just programmed in different vectors which may be authentic i don't know i don't know how you know maybe they traveled along the, the line and took some photos and stuff and then re- faithfully recreated them into black vectors on a white background so whilst there may be some enjoyment to be had if you're into that kind of thing from pushing coal into a fire there's little else here and there's nothing here to draw you in if you don't like trains or this kind of sim evening chocolate star <laughs> um is my final comment on that no not no this just don't work what about did, did you enjoy revisiting this kind of nonsense of course i didn't more <laughs> of the same slow moving crap trains don't excite me they don't. Uh, and I am pretty sure that the most diligent and obsessed train enthusiast would gip at this trudging brown and yellow nightmare. Taking a journey from point A to point B in something like this should not ever be one, anything lower than one FPS. I even put this in warp mode on the emulator and it still was slow. Yeah. And that was 400% faster than it should be. <laughs> terrible <laughs> two it featured badly drawn graphics including the really shitly drawn signals that were in the first game really yep. bad gradients and vectors it was just stupid and was it me or was there parts where there was no track yes yeah uh, um i don't get why anyone would enjoy it i don't it would be cheaper and more realistic to go on a short train journey <laughs> yes <laughs> so yes it do would. that or just, just run around that. the garden making choo-choo sounds <laughs> either way don't play this just no 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 now as you say evening starfish no <laughs> There you go, evening starfish. Yeah, evening chocolate starfish. There we go. There's not a lot to say more, is there? It's just more no, of that. It's rubbish. Go more listen to episode 29. Rubbish. Just go on a train. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's much better. Yeah. Uh, it may cost more these days, but you, know, you don't more. need to go far. Anyway, let's move along. We've got a couple more left. This episode's been trying. Graham, Morphicle, the transforming car. Another budget game for 199 so okay written by um andy chemnitz who also did something called bone cruncher and music's by michael winterberg you've been tasked to save the world in your transforming car morphicle to stop the world from being blown up by a bomb um, over various levels or three parts you must drive fly and search for the bomb to defuse it each level is split into those three parts and those consist of part one where you drive along the road in search of an entrance to the underground compound viewed from above avoiding touching the sides of the road or it's game over really frustratingly hard that was <laughs> really stupidly annoyingly hard and i thought that other game where you had to drive along trying to navigate thin roads was hard but yeah. this is a hot this is a whole new experience of pain <laughs> Yeah. You can transfer transport, well, you can trans, transform into the plane at this point, but it, it won't last very long if you do. The idea is that you're meant to transform into the different things to navigate. The, you won't, you just won't do that, which means you probably never get to part two, which is when you're in a glider and it's viewed from a sort of a side and a maze. It's controlled by the various icons. It's just terrible, terrible thing. Part three, it's, it's, and that's the only part that's actually reasonably redeeming because it's kind of a sliding level puzzle, um, which we've seen a few games where they have these couple of mini games where it's the sign of puzzle, sort of sliding bits puzzle, and um, you've got to sort of unscramble the picture of the bomb and some very squares. It's, it's just a dire game, all in all. The graphics are really tiny. So when you get to that first part and you're in the little tiny car, tiny car, and you transfer to a tiny little plane, you've got to navigate the really thin, tiny little roads. It's just yeah. crap. It's all very basic looking. It looks, it's just not been very well thought of. And controlling it, as I've said, is a bloody nightmare. One mistake and you're done. You are out. <laughs> and it happens a lot. Yeah. Unenjoyable. And music is torture. It's just torture. Simple as that. <laughs> it's colourful, I guess. <laughs> we maybe say that. Which is about the only thing that you could say that it's, it's got colour in it, which is not really anything, is it? <laughs> Other than that, it's just really crap. I didn't enjoy it. And again, for the final time, Go and get Kickstart 2. Goodness me. <laughs> yeah, if you want a budget title, crack our yeah, say. Just don't buy any of these one ninety nine dog eggs. They're awful. This is just the latest in the the last, I think, mercifully, of this episode and in a long line of utter shit one ninety nine games. Yeah. And I don't care. Zap gave this 50, uh, 58. What did they give this? 58. Are they dreaming? I don't know. 50, They're on something. They won't. What they didn't do was pl- they can't have played it. Anyway, we know that they didn't. Go and get kickstart too. Don't tell me you actually liked this. God, no. It felt like I've... I'd been kicked in the morphicles. <laughs> That's what I said. I can't see this without thinking of Testicle, the transforming car. I'm sometimes at a loss as to how these games get released in the state they do. Clearly, once again, this has been, this is, uh, no one has tested this. Or at least if they did get someone in, the uh, they did get someone in. the advert for it would have asked if they found the last V8, which is the game you're trying to remember, just That's a little it. too easy, um, <laughs> or Red Max. Did you find those easy? Well, you know, this is only stupidly hard because it's fundamentally stupid. 
Um, yep. Cars do not explode on contact with grass. Nope. They just don't. Walls, solid construction, yeah, but grass, no. You can change these things. You can make this better. Simply punish the player by making the car go slower on the grass, losing them time and making mm. it harder for them to complete the mission. Yep. Then they'd probably enjoy it more. Don't blow them up and then make them go through the odd starting sequence that seems to take forever oh, every time. God, that starting sequence. Yeah. No. <laughs> and there's not even the promise of like the, the really thumping Rob Hubbard Last V8 music to make you want to continue here because with the Last V8 you always had that music. Yeah. And it was always not like in this one. Oh, right. No, not in this one. God, not in this one. No. <laughs> um, why didn't anyone just consider the mechanics in the game before they released it? Why did no one ask what happens to cars on grass? <laughs> Stupid, unplayable <laughs> nonsense. Yep. So what do you say about this? It's rubbish. Nothing else. That's it. It's just, it's rubbish. 199 dump on the chest of the C64. Yeah, it really is. Morphical, the transforming Terrible. cack. You just, you just, there's this, there's, there's somewhere there's a sad person who got all these in one birthday bash, <laughs> didn't he? Thought he was no. in, yeah, he thought he was in game heaven. All these new budget titles, Bobby McCrap gift. <laughs> now, what? It's his birthday. We've got all these games. Well, I've got all these ace games. What have I got? Death Race. Uh, Star Force Nova. Uh, Morphical. Morphical. Uh, uh, Cosmonaut. Uh, Laurel and Hardy. Uh, swamp Fever. <laughs> swamp Fever. Uh, crap. 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 <laughs> Why couldn't you just bought me red lead? <laughs> <laughs> better than the others, though. It just, is better than the others. Yeah, it's God, all right. We've still got one more to go. All right. We've still got yeah. one more. I mean, you never know. Things may change. Things may change with the last one. Let's see. Let's see. Our last one is, well, Zap called this Night on the Tiles, but everywhere else has got it just called On the Tiles. That's right. Um, it says so On the Tiles when you start the game, doesn't it? Yeah, it says On the Tiles. So I don't know where Night on the I think, I don't know whether it's from the old advert or something. I don't know. Maybe it was pre-release. Uh, but this is On the Tiles. This was eight quid and scored 78%. So there are not many games where you play a cat, like an actual cat, not an anthropomorphized one, but an actual cat. And here in On the Tiles, you get to do just that. You're a cat. Um, but it's not easy being a cat. In fact, it's so tough, there's a poem on the back of the case telling you exactly how hard it is. I'm not going to read that poem here. I'm not doing it. It's quite long, and I'm sure you're thankful for that. I may post a picture of it somewhere, but we'll see. Anyway, On the Tiles, as it's properly known, it's an, it's an Odin game, this, published through Firebird and was programmed by Robert Tinman, who did Ark of Yesod. He also did iCups and UFO. Uh, it's got graphics by Andy Rickson, I think he also worked on some of those games and music by Keith Tinman, who did the heart, who did Heartland and mm. some other bits and bobs. So it's Odin. So like a lot of their games, it has some good production values, but some not so good mechanical ones. And we'll, we'll come to that in a bit. So in On the Tiles, you play a cat, as I've said, and you must collect four fish skeletons. I can't, is that right? From each level. And that allows you to move on to the next one and do the same or, or collect more fish skeletons. Um, you control the cat with a combo of joystick and f- keyboard, which is weird. So this is a sort of a it's a left to right scroller. You can go both directions, and it's kind of a platformy in that you can jump on some parts of the screen, like window ledges, fences, and you kind of have to make your way up and down the level to where the um, where the fish uh, fish skeletons are. So you can walk left and right by just moving left and right, or you can run left and right with the top diagonals. Fire button makes you jump, um, and but pressing the space bar spits out what I just looked like green phlegm. I don't know what it was. There may be more controls. <laughs> As pulling down or pushing up, I can't remember, makes you look into the screen. But I couldn't see a point for that unless you really like looking at 8-bit cat's asses, um, <laughs> which is unpleasant. Uh, anyway, th- there are many critters to avoid uh, or eat on the street, uh, the worst of which are owls. So <laughs> you're constantly being bombarded by owls. They swoop down on you um, and collision with them loses one of your nine lives. The same goes for hedgehogs who walk along the street. You can kill these, though, with your green phlegm. There are mice which you can eat for health, because you've got a health bar, uh, and frogs that will suck your energy uh, if, whilst you're in contact with them for strange reasons. Maybe they're you know poisonous frogs, I guess. There are also fleas which attach themselves to you, and if you get too many, you lose a life. And there are what looks like pigeons, I think, at the top of the screen. I think they give you health as well if you jump into them. The hedgehogs and owls, they, as I said, they need to be destroyed with the green phlegm. I don't know why. The visuals are very nice, I thought, with really well-animated characters, in particular your cat which looks like it was rotoscoped from a Whiskers advert, I thought. Um, it does, actually. Yeah. Which is no bad thing. I just recognise that cat run from yeah, an advert. Yeah. The other animals, they look also look pretty nice, and the backdrop is kind of stark. It's kind of in high res, uh, but I thought it's pretty well drawn. And there's a good feel to the game from the visuals and music as well, which complements the nighttime action. There's a nice feel to this game. The problem lies once again in the constant attack from owls, 
and hedgehogs and the like. It's just too damn hard, again, and really comes down to learning the way through the level. I mean, I know that's most platform games, but you're constantly bombarding and like, you know, where to jump instead just collect the fish. But it's just made wearisome by the constant, constant attack of owls. In my entire life, I've never seen so many owls in one place. What city is this that is replete with so many bloody owls? Um, <laughs> it just gets a bit silly. Your nine lives, because, you know, that's nice. Nine lives cat, thematically consistent. They're gone like that which is stupid really then the game is made all the harder by having to use the space bar to spit yep. what well, was stupid there is no there's no need for the walk no there isn't so, so why can't you just run use up for jump and fire button for spit you can still have down to show off your ass if you want but you know i don't know why the walk's there i don't get it uh just because i was constantly running because that was the only way i could avoid the bloody owls but you know having to constantly hit the space bar is a pain in the ass it's what it's like it's exactly what we said with army moves yeah look look at your controls and think does this work or have we over egged the pudding here if we did give the, does this cat need to walk oh but look at the sprites yeah we'll save some men- memory by taking those animated no there could be a decent game in here and I think I understand at this point uh, we're Odin, they were a bit buggered, some contract they had with Firebird, something they had to get a game a month out or something. They're under some kind of, li- I think this is, either that's coming or, or what happens to them, which is why they have all these crap games out. But really, Firebird, who produces, they should have looked at this and, 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 you know, and sort of realized with some, some slight tweaks, this could have been a, a, a nice, solid little platform, a bit different, nice aesthetics, good music, nice animation, a nice concept. But it's, you know, when they could have had that, a really enjoyable game and ran this annoying owl fest with stupid controls. And that's, I found that frustrating after a while and I turned it off because I couldn't be doing with the constant owl bombardment. Shame, really, as I kind of thought this might be something interesting and special, but just it's an almost, it's an almost this. 78% is too high. It's it's too high, but it's somewhere up there, but not quite that high. What about you? What did you take away from On the Tiles? Owls. Everyone is fond of owls. <laughs> Indeed. Except for mice and shrews and Simon Cowell. <laughs> to quote um, Weeble. Uh-huh. It's fitting that we'd end on a really bloody weird game, really, after this episode. I guess I'd never been a cat in a game before till now, I don't think. I don't think if I had. I don't think I played a cat. Maybe I have. I don't know. Um, not like this anyway. Not like a kind of real cat. Yeah, cat cat. So r- running and jumping and eating fish and skeletons and avoiding stuff and the owls. The, oh, the owls, the torturous owls. It's got merit, this, hasn't it? Graphics on the cat are good and the animation's slink- slinky. Yeah. Pretty cool. It's got, like you say, it's got cat thematics, you know, which is not easy to say. And so it, when it controls okay, you know, it's a bit odd to control. I think, like you said, they've not really thought it through, but and it was quite hard to get anywhere and do anything, really, generally, because you're just kind of moving around as a cat. But I like the way you could jump up on the little ledges and do stuff like that. Mm. You've got to avoid the owls, as we've said. Do owls eat cats, generally? Do they attack cats a lot? I don't remember. I know quite a few people who own cats. I don't remember them ever telling me about how menaced by owls they'd been. <laughs> I don't think city owls are a thing, are they? <laughs> well, even if they are, would they go for cats? Surely they would go for lesser Rats. Smaller, more grabbable things. Cats are quite ferocious and scratchy and kind of dangerous to an yeah, owl, yeah. I'd imagine. Yeah. And I thought in the hierarchy, you know, cats were more dangerous to birds generally. I know birds of prey are pretty big and scary, but, you know. Considering, anyway. like, on the screen at the same time, are pigeons, hedgehogs, frogs, and mice, the owl is going to pick all them before it chooses the cat. Yeah, exactly. Of mice and men, of hedgehogs and frogs. Is that the sequel? <laughs> um <laughs> I don't know. I just don't remember cats having a lot of interactions with hedgehogs and frogs and cat and owls. I guess they're doing it. It's a game, isn't it? I guess they're doing this. Uh, the main issue for me here was that the outside of wandering around, you know, picking up food, it wasn't really, really a lot to do. And as much as it was quite fun for, for a bit, soon wore off. Got a bit samey. And I got fed up of being attacked all the time. It just gets really sort of, it gets you down for a while. Yes. Like, oh, these owls, man, these owls. Just leave me alone. Stop picking on me owls. <laughs> yeah. So it got on my nerves. The music got on my nerves in the end. It's all right, but it got on my nerves in the end. I think I think with the game, actually, I got tired of the game before I got tired of the game music and the thematic of it. And eight quid, it's a bit weird for eight quid. Yeah. If this had been one ninety nine, it would have probably worked better as a budget game. <laughs> yeah. But because it's not, it's just a bit expensive for a game that's kind of one-dimensional, really, um, and just perpetually bombarding you with the owls, the owls. There's just too many owls in this game. Why the owls? <laughs> I don't know. Just too many I owls. Know. I don't know. Too too many owls. Um, anyway, um, it's not for me. This I'm allergic to cats anyway. So. Are you? I'm not, that's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. Oh, right. cats, yeah, yeah. I, I have to wear them with shovels. <laughs> okay. No, I have to. You can just avoid, you can just avoid them. That's how my allergy manifests. I'm sorry, it just does. It's 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 a, it's a physical Tourette's based around cat allergies. It's really strange. 
They haven't got a name for it. It's called owlisms. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm allergic apparently. to owls in cities. I've only ever seen <laughs> owls while driving around, like down country lanes and stuff, when they go flap above and you're like, oh, an owl. Well, that's because city owls can switch to stealth mode on. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> like, so if there's owls out there that are eating cats, I'm st- I want to stay away from them. They sound bloody dangerous. No, it's a big do. owl, that is, or a very I small it, cat. I thought it would be on the news as well. You know, don't let your cat out at night because it might get menaced by a, <laughs> an owl. Owls. To be fair, they've got amazing eyesight as well. So you know, they can spot. I mean, there's no way they're getting the scale wrong. They're the one owl that has evolved that's scaling of its eyes is all wrong. So from the high up in the sky, a cat looks like a mouse to it. When it gets down there, it's like, <laughs> oh shit, it's massive. Oh well, in for a penny, in for a pound. Ah! <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> get off. <laughs> ah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, weird game. Weird, weird, weird game. game. Yes, yeah, so on the tiles. Um, and that sort of implies that you're recovering from some kind of hangover, does it? I don't know. It does, yeah, because I was expecting this to be some some kind of more like, a, you know, like not Top Cat. But, but yeah, that Tom and Jerry but, maybe but kind of some some, some some sort of like you, you, you're a cat. I thought it was going to be some kind of weird adventure type thing where you kind of got to get home maybe after yeah. a night on the tiles yeah. and it's a cat but no you're just collecting fish skeletons and if they'd have just made this just wandering around as a cat just encountering stuff aren't there games nowadays that came out where you end up playing similar kind of thing like a vr game where you just you're a cat and well yeah or there's things like a uh, goat simulator and stuff I mean, like that so just it was maybe it's just way ahead of its time maybe i don't think it was <laughs> no, i don't remember no, being no. Um, menaced by I'd... owls in any other game quite as badly as i was in this one <laughs> the owls too many the owls <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There we go. Oh, what a selection of games we have had to endure for this week. Uh, so, what have we actually looked at? We looked at. Let me just go back to the beginning. We looked at Battle Droids or Red LED. Uh, take your pick, which we liked because we had to, because there's nothing else to like. Laurel and Hardy, which was awful. Cosmonaut, which we didn't like. Swamp Fever, which we didn't like. Revenge of the Mutant Camels 2, or Return of the Mutant Camels, which technically is good, but it's just more Minter. Ace 2, which mm, technically probably all right, but eh. Death Race, which was no. <laughs> Star Force Nova, no. Evening Star, definitely no. Morphical, the transforming car, stupidly no. And then finally, on the towels, towels on the towels, <laughs> on the towels because <laughs> of the owls. They've affected the your brain. The owls. <laughs> Max <Yeah>. Bacon now. <laughs> What's on the towels? Pleather. Our pleather. towels are made of pleather. One hundred percent pleather. <laughs> it won't dry my skin. That's the main effect. Yes, <laughs> it just rubs it around. <laughs> it just moves the water around. It moves the water off your skin onto another surface. That's a wipe. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it's not a pleather wipe. <laughs> <laughs> what is your pleather? <laughs> Watch as he takes the pleather from the serpent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what this episode has done to us. It does. Uh, that's it. Right. So we finish off October next week. What we, we got do. to go? We've got obviously film and TV, but we've also got Mega Apocalypse. We do. Uh, we've also got a load of more budget games, Laser Force. I mean, oh, that only scored twenty nine percent. We've got the last mission. I think that's an arcade uh, conversion. The Tube, Flunky, Toad Force, uh, Arcade Classics. Okay. okay. Jackal and I think that's Jackal and Wide. I think it is not Jackal and Wild. I've noted here. Yeah. Jackal and Wide. I think Prohibition. Pirates of the Barbary Coast, mm. or pirating. Enforcer, um, which I think is another Gavin Rayburn one, because of course it's, it it's named after a, it's named for something from his DVD, or his video collection. <laughs> um, and Black Magic is our final one. Okay. So we've got all that coming next week, as I said, along with film and TV. I think that's about it. God, it that was a trying week. It that really was. was. I was just running on empty by the end of that lot and then just getting menaced by owls, constantly by owls. The owls. Yeah, so many owls. Um, as ever, if you wish to uh, support the podcast in a financial sense, you can do so by heading over to our Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash zap to the past. Pick a tier and, um, and lob some cash our way. That is helps us keep everything spinning pays for the therapy about owls um and stuff like that there are loads of stuff on there that at the 
the, the main tier it's access to the discord server early release podcasts ability to ask us stuff when we do our ask us anything podcasts and things like that so there's uh high score challenges weekly challenges all kinds of stuff going on if you don't don't do that you can leave a review for us that's always cool we put like a review that. out for us or or even if you can't do that then just recommend us to somebody and just say yeah listen to this <laughs> have a listen to this <laughs> <laughs> These two idiots are going on about pleather and owls. You'll love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Pleather and bacon. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah, play, play him that bit and then see what happens. And then you didn't tell me this is a C64 podcast. I was a spectrum person. <laughs> Although I found their content about pleather very interesting. Absolutely. And I wish to subscribe to their newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> pleather. Our newsletter's written on pleather. <laughs> Absolutely. It's carved into pleather. <laughs> <laughs> with a pleather pen and a pleather envelope <laughs> it's dead heavy costs us loads to send them out <laughs> and then the, and then the uh, postman always complains because they just flop and won't go through the letterbox <laughs> oh dear a pleather delivery <laughs> I'm here to deliver you pleather <laughs> Oh, right. Okay. We have to finish. We have to go. Okay. Um, so, uh, as ever, I've been Adrian Mills. And I have been Max Bacon, Brain <laughs> Ruddings. <laughs> and you've been listening to Zapped to the Pleather. And we will be back again <laughs> next week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the Zap to the Past podcast. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into the world of Commodore 64 games, as well as the music, films and TV from around the 1980s, driven, of course, by the issue of Zap 64 magazine published at that time. We will return with a whole new batch of games and stuff to talk about next week. Until then, if you want to listen to or download previous episodes of Zap to the Past, and why wouldn't you, they can all be found on our website at zaptothepast.com, as well as being available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, Audible, Player FM, and, well, pretty much anywhere where we can upload them. By the way, we do always love to hear from our amazing listeners, so if you'd like to contact us about anything in the podcast or beyond, you can do so by emailing us at zaptothepast at gmail.com. We're also active on Twitter under at Zaptuther, as well as Facebook, Instagram, and most social media platforms. Just search for Zap to the Past and you'll find us. Oh, and if you like the podcast and what we're doing, please do like, share, review, rate us. It really helps. Something, apparently. The Zap to the Past podcast is written and produced by Adrian Mills and Graham Ruddings and recorded at Flaky Bits 2.0 Studio. All opinions expressed are those of the writers, and while we indeed love Zap64 magazine, the Zap to the Past podcast is not affiliated with it in any way. Stay safe, see you next time, and remember, we play these games so you don't have to.